Steve and Yeah. They are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was muted. Sorry. All right, whenever Fran gets settled, I'll start streaming it on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, it's funny the the link that got went went out like an hour ago. It didn't have the um, second number at the bottom, the participant ID one. Had the meeting ID, but didn't have the participant ID. So I went back into my Outlook and found that one. So I that's, that's why I got back. Are you all set, Fran? Yeah, I'm all set. All right, let me get going on YouTube. <clears throat> Just open up a box of chocolate chips. You guys can join in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's taking longer than I expected. It's okay. All right, good to go. Okay, so the uh, planning commission uh, planning commission meeting of August twenty fourth will come to order. Can we have a roll call? Sure. Uh, Mr. Lesko. Here. Mr. Baxendale. Present. Mr. Demeglio. Uh, Mr. Demeglio, sorry. Here. 
Ms. Shockley? Oops. Here. Ms. Langallis? Here. Ms. Penniston? Here. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson? Here. And Mr. Mushak? Here. Full house. All right, so before we get going, I'm gonna say a few words for the public hearing. Uh, I just saw an email that came through, Steve, so that we're gonna allow uh, repeat speakers where we are, but if there's new speakers, those will go first. This will follow the same rules of any other public hearing, uh, when either, either by email or speaking, name and address. That's, those are the rules of public hearings. Any uh, anonymous emails or anybody wishes to speak and not give their names, um, it's not going to it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, so Steve has a I think you have a presentation before we go into the public hearing. Five minutes. Yeah, five minutes tops. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so you see the presentation. Just want to make sure before I start. It'll be one second if I get it. Okay. Um, that's slide one, so that was pretty quick. Just to give a brief overview and put a little perspective on uh, some of the comments and some of the questions that have come in in, in emails as well. So uh, th as we started out, the yellow circle represents the, the TOD boundary, which is an accepted boundary by the state of Connecticut OPM when they look at these things. Um, and that really represents a half mile radius around the, the two stations because there's two platforms, one on the east side, one on the west side. So there's two platforms that uh, are affected there. And that's what the circle represents. Uh, what what the, the large part of the discussion has come down to over probably, and I don't know if I'm exaggerating, probably close to a six month period has been the proposed new zone, which is the EVTZ, which is the East Norwalk Village TOD zone. That's shown with the yellow outline with the orange hatch through there. 95% of that right now is currently zoned neighborhood business. So we're proposing to rezone that to a different zone. The total area within that circle is 490 acres approximately. The new zone represents 35 acres of that or 7%. So in essence, we're really not proposing to touch the majority of the study area. And if you look at the, there's another area I've shown on there with red, red outline with kind of like a blue hatch through that. That's an area that's currently zoned neighborhood business that we're proposing to rezone to C residential. So that's about two and a half percent of the whole, whole study area. So if you subtract that from the, the larger proposed zone, you're down to about 5% of the entire study area that we're proposing to change. And that represents, um, the East Avenue corridor, which I think really needs some TLC. Um, and just to put it in perspective, the, if you just took the raw land within that area and divided it by the proposed density that could possibly be realized, you get about 700 units. Now our consultant has said, you're not gonna realize that. You might be get half of that just based on all the constraints and the realities of things. Because if you think about these parcels, they're small in area. They're all, for the most part, under different ownership. So some of these may not get developed or they're not going to develop over a long period of time. And hopefully this little video clip doesn't make anybody um, nauseous. I hope it works with my trying this out. So hopefully this puts together. This is a street view going down East Avenue. And this is one of the things we wanted to get at was redefining this area. Because you know there were some comments made, well, the, the character and the fabric of East Norwalk. Well, I don't think this East Avenue piece going down from 95, going down south of the train station is defining anything with the East Norwalk um, vision or feel. It's, I think it really detracts from the rest of the area. It's not a walkable area. It's not attractive. The building design and typology are completely mixed. There's a lot of uses that are incompatible with an area that's in proximity to, uh, you know, it's a Metro North mainline station that goes directly into New York City. And some of these uses in here are, are not the best uses of property. You have numerous gas stations there, 
one-story buildings, one-and-a-half-story buildings that are in proximity to a train station. It, it, it detracts from making this the area that everybody wants it to be. And just a little closer look at the numbers, because I, I think thing, it comes down to um, really the crux of things comes down to the density and the height that's proposed. And the top, slide, top graph on this slide really kind of shows what the difference is. So the current regulations allow 35 feet in height, two and a half story buildings, and a density of 1,650 square feet of lot area per unit. So we're only proposing an additional 10 feet in one story. It's not a lot. These are, you know, there's not a big difference between a residential standard and what we're proposing here. Now, obviously, the density is more. I'm not trying to sugarcoat that, and I do understand that when you add more density, you're adding more cars. And I know that East Norwalk, excuse me, East Avenue in particular, is not always fun in the morning to drive through. There's a lot of reasons for that, and there is proposed um, fixes for the roadway network that should happen over the next couple of years that'll move that traffic along. And I'm not naive enough to think that everybody's gonna hop on the train that moves here. That's not, not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that the, to get the benefits that people want and get the vision for people want, this is how we recommend that is, this area changes. The bottom table just provides a little bit of context compared to some of the other zones, just to show you what's allowed in other areas, where there's numerous areas in the city that are also near transit that allow you know, three or four times the density and height that we're proposing here. Another really, really important um, item that we did discuss several times at our meeting last week is that the draft zoning regulations and the draft design guidelines are appendices to the plan. Those are gonna to have to go through a separate public hearing process post adoption of this plan. So that means that they have to go back in front of the zoning commission for public hearings and also we'll refer back to you for additional comment. So that it's not like this is the only uh, you know, look that will happen with this. The second part of that is just uh, last week we sent out an RFP to rewrite the zoning regulations. The zoning commission is going to undertake that task starting this fall. I've carved out a little money as part of that process to have somebody take a look at the draft parking and draft amenity schedule that we have within the plan. Because there were some questions raised that you know, maybe the parking is not going to work. And there was questions about the amenity schedule. So we don't want to propose something that's not going to work, otherwise it does nobody any good. So we're going to have a second set of eyes look at that. And if adjustments need to get made to that, we'll make those adjustments. And that'll be part of the second public process that is required to happen as part of this. Um, the last slide really just, you know, there are a lot of people that put into comments that, you know, we, we need to slow things down. I mean, I, I understand completely if people don't like the height and the density that we're proposing. I don't agree with those comments, but I understand that this chart points out the outreach that we've done as part of this. You know, the, the committee itself met over 20 times. We had three really good public sessions as part of this. The, the presentation that you saw last week, um, Emily and I, and also by myself, gave truncated versions of that to six or seven different groups within the city. We also had two public presentations of the plan before your first hearing last week. Tonight's the second hearing on this. The planning committee of councils holding their public hearing on September 10th. And then there has to be an adoption hearing of this commission again at the end of September. So I think for outreach and the ability to comment, we've gone, I think, really to great lengths to get input on this. Again, I understand that people don't like things, not everything in the plan, but it th th comes down to these, you know, those, those basic issues. It comes down to the additional story of height, which equates to 10 additional feet, which is really not much at all, and it comes down to they don't like the added density. There's not a lot of other elements to go through. I know some people have said they don't like the promenade, con promenade concept, but overall, the main elements of the plan come down to this, and I think that's my last slide. <clears throat> okay, a few a uh, few more things before we open up the public hearing. Um, I'm not giving a time limit. I'm not going to, you know, cut you off, but um, stick to the issue at hand. And um, I don't know how many people are sign up to speak. And we've had, um, uh, so we'll take it as, as we go. 
we've had um, uh, emails sent in how we shouldn't be continuing with the um, with the Zoom meetings that we should wait until we can all uh, you know be in a room. Well, I saw the the governor's report that came out a little while ago this afternoon, which looked at cases. You know, this comes out every night on weekends. It comes out on Monday. Since Friday, there have been 459 new cases. So we are where we are. We're meeting by Zoom. We got to make the best of what we have and. This is where we are. So we'll open up the public hearing. Brian, you got the um, the list there, or the you know who goes first, or however it is. If you have emails, Steve, I don't know if uh, you want to answer a couple of those, or however you want to do it. Can I make one comment, please? Go ahead, uh, Steve. Your uh, I believe slide four height and stories were switched. Did you did you mention that? If you, if you want to just look at slide four, I want to just clarify that uh, it looked like a typo. No, I think it's okay. I can pull it back up if you like. All right, you had height, you had height. All right, it looked like height at four and stories at 40 or 60. Which oh, at the bottom. <laughs> sorry, yes, <laughs> the bottom uh, part, bottom chart. I had them switched. Yes, but I had it the, for the um, the TOD zone, the proposed zone, and the north, the neighborhood business zone were correct. But you are correct in the second part. Yes, thanks. Oh, good. Well, it just I was looking at that with a little bit of shock. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve, put put that chart back up so everybody can see what, what you're talking about there, and what's the sure. number. Yeah, so that if you can see what I'm um, pointing to here, so that the existing MB zone, the height is allowed 35 feet and proposed is 45. Existing allowed stories is two and a half, proposed three and a half, and then the density. Down here is I have them backwards. This is just showing what's going on in a, two of the other zones. Not It's more for reference than anything else. But the stories and height is backwards on those, yes. Nothing proposed to change with either of those. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Brian, we have speakers uh, lined up. Yeah. Can't hear you. Hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so there's two ways to speak. If you'd like to, um, you can use the raise your hand function, um, and then I'll bring you over so you can speak. And then if you're dialed in on a phone, you would hit star nine, and that will raise your hand, and I'll do the same thing. Um, so uh, Michael Descala had his hand up, so I'll, I'll bring him over to the down. But... Brian, I can't hear you. You're, you're going in and out. Okay. You there, Michael? Hi, Mike Descala. Address? Maywood Road, Norwalk, Connecticut. All right, go ahead, Mike. First, I'd like to thank Steve and, and the commission and all the outside consultants for doing a tremendous job of keeping, first of all, I think the TOD plan was well thought out and, uh, and it's very, very open to the discussion so that the entire city of, of Norwalk, especially East Norwalk residents, are fully understanding to what, uh, what is proposed. So my name is Michael Descala. The name of my company is MF Descala and Company. We are located at Head of the Harbor South. I was born and raised in Norwalk. Norwalk is my home. Personally, and as an investment company, I care very much about Norwalk. I build or buy in Norwalk. My company maintains to the highest possible standards the management of the properties. We have pride of ownership and we treat our tenants as our guests. We do not develop, purchase buildings, 
for the purpose of flipping for profits. We own, manage, and keep them long term. In order to keep you to relate to our company, some examples of what we own in the NAWA, the trolley barn on Wall Street, Marshall Shopping Center, County Mall Shopping Center, Sedona Plaza, all on Westport Avenue. Also, Sono One, a new apartment house being completed on Martin Luther King Drive, and West Pine Street, which is across the street from O'Neill's restaurant in South Mala. I would like to speak about the new proposed TOD in, in East Nauk in, in a different vein. I'd like to explain what it's like to live, as, I've had, as I have experienced, in a mixed use committed community. The benefits that come with these types of communities the definition of a mixed-use community is a walking community where people and families live, socialize, dine, shop, bike, and enjoy the art outdoors. I have experienced what it's like to live in a mixed-use community in Europe. It's a, it's, it's a very social environment. We walk to town, have dinner, and are entertained by a variety of public amenities, music, arts, street vendors on the sidewalks, and <laughs> evening firework display. This is what I envision for East Norwalk. We need to revitalize the boarded up and fenced up shops and create activity. This can only be accomplished by bringing people back to the area, otherwise we're just wasting our time. Without apartments and people, you will not have a mixed use neighborhood, nor a, nor a sense of community. Foot traffic drives retail. For example, look at Wall Street in the vicinity of the trolley barn, which I historically restored 25 years ago. Unfortunately, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a dead area. Even prior to the pandemic, there was no life on Wall Street. We know the reason why. There's not enough apartments or people in and foot traffic to support any of the restaurants and retail. Presently, there are six beauty salons and one tattoo parlor within a one, one block radius in Wall Street. Wall Street has the highest density of vacancy that I've, that I've seen. Noting without retail, there is no tax revenue for NOAA. Eventually, the vacancies lead to further issues that are undesirable. Wall Street needs additional residents to live downtown in order to support a mixed-use community, which in turn would support, in return, the restaurants, stores, and activities. East Norwalk is very similar to Wall Street. Both of these areas need revitalization. Well-designed apartment complex brings life back to the city. They provide their own parking and allow people to walk to their destinations, which relieves traffic congestion. The TOD plan has been well thought out. For example, the sidewalks are wider and user friendly to allow walking for families or groups of people. Despite what critics say about real estate taxes, it is an undisputable fact that apartment houses more than pay for themselves and have a net positive effect. For example, real estate taxes for ahead of the harbor, which I developed in, uh, in uh, off of Wall Street, prior to the develop development, the taxes were 14,000 a year. Presently, they are over 300,000 a year. Head of the Harbor provides its own garbage removal, snow removal, lighting, striping, and maintenance to the street. Zero cost to the city. I built my home in Norwalk 40 years ago. My wife and I are now empty nesters. As many of our friends, we feel that there has not been much thought about the needs for empty nesters 
to downside yet stay in Norwalk. Our plan for East Norwalk on our project would be to provide such a community support to support those who wish to continue to live in Norwalk and enjoy socializing with others in a community environment. Lastly, but not least, I would like to tell you about the health benefits of living in a mixed use neighborhood. Those of you who are familiar with the publication Blue Zone, which is based on areas of the world that have the highest living pe people. This book points out to the various health benefits of mixed use planning strategies. Some of the benefits of TLD plan are as follows. You revitalize the neighborhood. You reduce congestion. You boost local economy and business. You create safer streets. You encourage walking in social connectivity. That's very important. Mixed use neighborhoods help create livable, sociable, bikeable, and vibrant communities where people live longer and with better quality of life by making semi-permanent and permanent changes to the built environment. Mixed use neighborhoods provide comfortable pedestrians access to restaurants and stores. Co-mingling residential areas reduce the need to own cars and encourage social connection. This is the type of environment I like to see when I think of East Norwalk. I believe this is a well-designed plan that the TOD presents Thank you for listening to my vision for East Norwalk. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? No. Brian, next. All right, uh, so next, Diane Loricello. Good evening. Good evening. You can hear me. This is, my name is Diane Loricella. I currently live at 97 West Norwalk Road in the uh, Wilton, in the Meadow Woods Condominium Group. Um, I have lived throughout Norwalk over the many 34 years that I have been in this fine city. I lived in East Norwalk for just about, uh, for under a, a year. However, I have made it my primary purpose is to get to know all the portions of Norwalk because we are one city. I know people who live in all the different areas of Norwalk. One thing that I had noticed is that over the years, East Norwalk did not change very much. On occasion, there were some new, new uh, uh, office or mostly that um, right near um, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, there was a multifamily housing. But I think that I was very happy. I wanted to thank the staff and the commission for hosting the number of public outreach uh, plans, but also allowing us kind of like into your world through Zoom meetings. I'm really happy that the city has allowed the public to view your planning commission meetings. I think that this East Norwalk TOD is well thought out, as other speakers have said. However, there are some things I wanted to add as suggestions, and sometimes I've said them before. The first thing is, in order to reduce some of the, at times I think, harsh criticism, sometimes I think unfairly, other times I understand it, if this commission, before they finalize the wording, could read the public meeting notes and cross check things that neighborhood leaders and others said during those public meetings to see if you kind of crossed the T's and dotted the I's, I think that would go a long way in, a, in making sure the public felt that they were heard. I know that has been one of the criticisms. I do think through the vision set out in this plan that I read, that a lot of the concerns were heard. Here is my final thoughts. Um, and actually, um, because 
I don't know how long this meeting is going. I'm hoping I, I might not get a second shot at this. So as far as this plan goes, I say, let's make it greener. I'm sure many of you are not surprised that I would state this. And here are some details on what I mean by it. I do believe that we need to rethink or rewrite the sustainability goals and make them requirements, make them standards. Let's make any development opt out of our basic bottom line standards that many other cities and towns have done, not opt in because currently our culture in Norwalk has been, let's hope the private sector adds renewables or lead silver or gold or bronze. Let's make it a standard, a, a base, and we hope of course they'll do better because it saves them money operating costs and it's actually been found in the business to be kind of like a marketing piece when you have a greener building, especially with our younger renters and owners. I, in the past, have brought to your attention Jonathan Rose's very good book called The Well-Tempered City. I would love it to be listed in the back if you have a listing of some of the documents and books that you included in putting together this particular document. It is a terrific review of a well-tempered city, meaning balanced, sustainable, and green, as well as offering tax benefits, health benefits, and the like. Also, please refer to our Federal Department of Energy. They have terrific programs, many of them free, that will help our municipality get back in the program that other cities and towns are doing in Connecticut, certain ones. Let's make sure that we offer energy incentives as well. I also think that this city and this commission I would love to see you initiate it, a sustainability plan for the city of Norwalk with a paid sustainability manager to help you all get to those points in your upcoming trials and tribulations, as well as our zoning commission. We need someone that is in city hall day in and day out, not just on occasion when we have a need for every 10 years for a POCD or on occasion when we do these vision statements to amend the POCD. As far as the point system, I really admire that we have such an incentive system. Unfortunately, I don't have the document in front of me, so I can't give you the page, chapter, and verse, but the incentives for the point system, I want to say let's keep it simpler. It is a little bit too complicated and again, I would rather it be an opt-out system. In other words, a developer would have to tell you or the zoning commission why they couldn't have the solar panels, why they couldn't add the um, green infrastructure, instead of hoping and wishing that they do it themselves. I think our city has to get with the program as far as sustainability, green infrastructure, and the like. I know we have the wording in this document, but words and wishes are not what will make it so. It has to be standards. And in that way, I, re I agree with Dev Desai, who I think spoke last time. She'll probably speak again. But uh, if she doesn't, I uh, hope to meet her because I agree with her take on it. And I have, before she, this whole vision was put on paper, I have talked about this. One of my favorite homes here in the village area. Hello? OK, someone speaking. Uh, almost done. Uh, I believe, like Bridgeport, the city of Bridgeport, we need and we could in this particular area, especially since you mentioned the sewage treatment plant area and the DPW um, uh, uh, truck, trucking area or the um, garage. Uh, in Bridgeport, they put together some clean energy zones. And in those zones, they were able to get incentives from the Federal Department of Energy to help pay for things like hydrogen run uh, uh, utilities. And um, it's, it's something that I think we should mention in this particular project. Again, as an incentive, but also an opt out 
I think in every form, uh, uh, permit form, that um, the, the development community fills out, I want to see in the form itself, literally having a checklist and having them opt out with an actual reason or excuse, as opposed to hope and wishing. Um, the sewage treatment plant, uh, it should be, and the DPW garages as emergency energy areas for essential services, including the East Norwalk Firehouse, some food stores that I hope we can once get in the center of East Norwalk. I think as the issue of density, I am fine with density as long as it's with the controls. And I agree with some of what the staff has said is that the frenzy about the fact that going forward with, with this plan, I am not worried that there will be overbuilding. I do think with the former hat factory, that was unfortunate that this had not taken place earlier, this, this good discussion about vision. But I do think going forward, uh, controlled density, we do need feet on the street. I think uh, Mike Descal had mentioned, you do need feet on the street to have community and create activity. Right now we have a boneyard, which is wonderful. It's a wonderful historic treasure, but those folks aren't going to be play, uh, uh, taking up seats at restaurants. What I would hope that the East Norwalk Neighborhood Association and others would be asking some of the current um, landowners, for instance, those that, that own Pennies 2, which has been, was empty before they, they did a beautiful job rebuilding what had burned down, but it's all empty. What's going on there? Also, Penny's Diner. Currently, it needs an upgrade, if not being rebuilt because it's, it's, not, it's, it's not as fine of an establishment as we were always hoping for. These are all improvements that could be made. I ask for truly affordable housing, so I ask that this commission look again at the enabling legislation from the legislature about what is known as granny pods, which are in only in those parcels that can have the space in the backyard that tiny homes can be built. I also would like us to have modifications to the accessory apartment laws or zones. I would like to see this in this East Norwalk plan, this TOD plan. Uh, two last things, future possibilities. The St. Thomas School properties definitely have nowhere to go but up as far as them selling off their school property that's not being used. I do know they use some of it for housing um, unwed mothers, and it's a terrific program, really beautiful. But maybe that could be moved elsewhere. But the thing is, for now, the school itself, to my knowledge, is not being used as best and highest use. The Wells Fargo property. A lot of comments I've read online about this property, it is privately owned. And I do feel, because I have seen what the Descala company has done elsewhere in the city, is that I believe that this bank is not the highest and best use for this property. And I do think that there needs to be a better use. And from what I've understood, there could be multifamily housing. I would say maybe there should be a clamp on the number of units. I know that is of concern to people, but we have to make sure that there's parking on site and, I'm, and a, a beautiful building. And I do believe from what I've seen in the Descala areas, I, I'm, I think that with the architectural review and all of the visionary um, kind of check, check marks that this TOD plan puts in place, I am not concerned about that property. Um, the Winbaum building, I'm calling it, which is 25 Van Zandt. He's proposed over time a trade school model I think that would be a terrific use of some of that building. And I think our city should make it easier for people that have vision for utilizing old manufacturing buildings. I also, as you know, I'm very in favor of manufacturing, but make it clean, make it green, and let's make sure we have uh, the right kind of mix so that we get good paying jobs. Lastly, on the issue of permits. Diane, you gotta wrap it up. You're going off okay, 50. I will. Thank you very much. On the issue of permitting, let's make it thorough, but user-friendly so that our development community 
can do what we like, but not have to jump through 10 hoops when five hoops will do. With that, I thank you. And again, let's look at standards for green. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dan. Hey, Fran, um, just a heads up, uh, Tamara and Steve Ferguson had lost power. I think Steve's using his cell phone now, unless he got his power back, but she emailed me, said she lost yes, power. Yes, I am. So I'll, I'll with you as long as I can, okay? Okay. Tamara's back in too, I see her down there. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're out of power or just using their phones, but just a heads up. All right. Okay. Uh, Who's next? I'm, I'm using my phone right now, but I'm out of power. Uh, next is Diane Beacon. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, Brian, you're a little, a little hard to um, hear again, just so you know. And um, Sorry. Thank you, commissioners and, um, and Chair DiMeglio. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before you start the clock on me. Um, I wasn't able to access the meeting tonight, so I missed what was the explanation of, um, I tried to get in through the tomorrow.nawalk.ct site and the link brought me to the Glover Avenue plan. So has that since been corrected? Because ENNA directed um, much of the community to go through the city's link to get there. Steve are, are people able to access through, through that site, which is the, the um, preferred site? So that I'm not sure, you, I think you just clicked on the link to the, um, that set of plans. That's not telling people to go there. There's no, the POD I, I the update the, there, the East the, Norwalk um, POD one is there. They basically just copied the agenda we have off our site and put it there. Yeah, I, I saw, but I think they um, may have put the wrong link in. When you click on the link for the Zoom meeting with the actual Zoom ID, it's drawing up the Glover Avenue plan. You can try it from there. And um, well, I'm not clicking on it while I'm live here. I'm not, because then it's going to kick okay, me out so, of this. So anyway, I'll, I'll just say then, obviously, that may not have been corrected. And um, the literature and uh, information that we put out to the community is that they can either um, sign up for emails and get the link from us um, if they're using our emails. Um, but we always advise them to use the site that the city has instructed us to refer residents to. And that's the site. I tried it multiple times and every time I clicked on the Zoom link, it brought me to the Glover Avenue Planning and Zoning um, application. Um, and then um, just for the chairwoman's um, information as well, um, we had been told prior to the start of the first meeting that people who spoke last week would not be allowed to speak this evening. So, um, and, and thank you for um, modifying that so that if there's time, they can still add on, but perhaps then you'll keep this open for, they can submit via email if they had additional comments and didn't realize that they could in fact speak again this evening if that would be okay with you. Um, so, say, um, so, Steve, then we issue something saying that repeat speakers would not be allowed? I think you're on mute. Steve Kleppen. I, I, yeah, I don't recall if we said that last week or not. We may have, I don't remember. No, I, I don't recall. Uh, Diane, maybe yeah. it's communicated. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, saying it. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, we, we did, and, that, and that's why we put the instructions out. But, it, but as long as people can still email something in tomorrow, I'm sure the commission will take it into account, I would hope. Um, and so, um, for, for the record, my name is Diane Cece. I live on Olmsted Place. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the East Norwalk Neighborhood Association. And uh, before I begin, I just wanted to let the commission know that um, earlier this afternoon, we submitted a document um, through Steve um, to be distributed to you at some point that has um, our actual analysis of two, the two major components of the plan um, that we refer people to. And that's what um, in the plan on page six referred to as the plan's top 10 action items. And then our also analysis of the end of the plan, I think it starts on page 114, and that's the actual implementation plan and timetable. 
So our analysis of that is, is was sent to you separately as an email. And what follows tonight is um, ENNA's position statement. And I, I think this runs about six or seven minutes, some um, chairwoman, and I hope you'll indulge us because we'd like to make a lot of points here. The East Norwalk Neighborhood Association has expressed concerns about adopting the TOD plan as drafted. While we appreciate the Oversight Committee's inclusion of the Village Design District guidelines and the attempt to tie height and density bonuses directly to public amenities that may be desired by the community, we feel the plan still falls short in addressing the community's number one concern, overdevelopment. In addition to e and bringing collective resident sentiment, sentiments to the city, individual East Norwalkers have provided their written statements, sent emails, spoke on Zoom calls, and at community visioning workshops. That this level of potential density is not how they envision improving East Norwalk. The vast majority of residents we interact with are adamantly opposed to implementing this and have expressed the need for further consideration of the recommended zone changes. In a recent ENNA survey with 300 respondents, 88% of them would limit plan-wide development to under 500 units. And of them, 67% wanted no more than an additional 200 units throughout the entire plan area. Although ENNA had a seat at the TOD Oversight Committee, it had not ensured residents' wishes were fully considered. Our three compromise solutions to the density and height were rejected, and we've not received a response proposal to define limitations. It's also concerning that we've been told there are, quote, zero plans on presenting the Planning Commission with a denial option, end quote. That effectively is approving and advancing the plan to the Planning Committee regardless of any meaningful response to residents' concerns. The plan does contain some controls that would normally mitigate potential overdevelopment, unsightly architecture, and inadequate public realm, but it does not address the fact that once it's adopted, the recommended zoning changes are approved, the public will have no say on what gets developed. Special permit process is often a false security for residents, as those applications are rarely denied in Norwalk. Special permits do require public hearings, but the standards are vague and ca often can't be effectively argued by lay people. Special permits do get approved with conditions, but often those are bargained down by developers citing financial hardships. It's unfair to ask East Norwalk residents to support a plan that still has the potential to add a thousand apartment units over time when they've expressed their strong opposition. This plan document actually notes several times that residents' number one concern and objection is the proliferation of apartments. We'd like to outline our primary concerns for you. One, with the possibility of a thousand units, there's no plan for commensurate parking or for handling additional traffic. The public workshops emphasize walkability, cyclability, and public transport, even via a trolley to, along East Avenue with satellite parking lots but there's no specific plan indicating commitment to these prioritized requests of the, of the residents. Two, the plan fully depicts potential development at Winfield Street, but is missing depictions of the most controversial uh, parcels. For example, at I-95 and the St. Thomas Church School, and especially the development of the Wells Fargo parcel at Mill Pond, which we understand is nearing submission. Three, the plan recommends aligning sev several privately owned, recommends realigning several privately owned parcels to make the empty lot that exit 16 more marketable and profitable, but doesn't address the odd shaped uh, parcel directly across the street on East Avenue, or take into account several options for the state to modify the highway interchange. Four, the plan maximizes rather than optimizes the entire center of East Norwalk build out by encouraging new mixed use department developments rather than proactively working with current owners of parcels to activate the ground floors and add minimal residential units. Five, the appendix devoted to parking and traffic is unclear about the potential options and doesn't utilize up-to-date traffic data. The plan utilizes 2017 traffic counts prior to the mall 
and make reference to traffic impacts once 230 East Avenue breaks ground, um, which it actually has over a year ago. Six, residents would like to know why we why would we trade bonuses for increased heights of 30% and 100% increases in density for public amenities that they would expect to be included without any trade-offs? Seven, contrary to TOD fundamentals, the plan does little to promote affordable housing at and near the train station. Instead, it could likely result in high market rate rents for at least 90% of all the new units, as demonstrated by other recent development projects. Also not considered in the plan is diverse housing, such as the national trend for, quote, missing middle multifamily housing, such as duplexes and quadplexes, and also to allow accessory dwelling units, so-called granny units, within single family zone parcels. And eight, finally, many residents express concern that this plan suggests East Milwaukee can only be improved by relaxing zoning regulations in order to maximize developer profit levels versus keeping existing neighborhood scale zoning and working with the current landowners on East Avenue to improve facades, invest in the underutilized buildings, and work with our economic development department to market and rent empty storefronts. There are many beneficial and desirable aspects of the plan. And while we're in complete support of the components that improve, that improve infrastructure, we believe residents are justified in rejecting the premise that infrastructure improvements would require new development. Many of the des desirable aspects of this plan are hard to appreciate, while the area and density of the proposed development continues to be of concern. Residents are mistrustful of a process that resulted in a handful of fit studies and limited depictions of build-outs. And those who spent hours attending the two workshops in one open house deserve a plan with more clarity on the points of concern. We would prefer that the city take a bit more time to work on compromise with the residents regarding the density limitations. If the plan advances without compromise on the density, ENA and will continue to assist the residents in expressing their concerns with overdevelopment, parking and traffic issues, environmental concerns, the strain on city services, and the haste with which the city is moving the draft to adoption. In closing, ENA will continue to call upon our elected and appointed officials to postpone advancing the plan to further public hearings until the public can resume in-person meetings at City Hall and public venues. This plan and its far-reaching long-term impacts is simply too important to our property values and quality of life to expect residents to participate remotely during these restrictions. And because there's nothing preventing a request prior to September 15th for an additional extension of time, we believe it would be worthwhile to allow for additional revisions that best reflect East Norwalk residents' input. Please postpone advancing this plan at this time and let all the stakeholders work again collaboratively to find a solution to the density issue that we hope would be mutually beneficial to residents and the prospective developers. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. One thing I'm gonna add right now, since uh, there's been, there was a miscommunication about people that spoke already and um, anyway, whatever the miscommunication was, I'm gonna hold this hearing open until tomorrow so that comments can come in so close of business tomorrow, okay? Next. Hi, um, Megan McNeil. Brian, how come we can't hear you today? I'm having laptop issues. I don't know what it is. But, well, we can hear you fine right now. So what did you say? Uh, Megan McNeil. Address? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Uh, Megan McNeil, 31 Betts Place. Okay. All right, so I'd like to start by just saying that I, <clears throat> I am on the board of ENNA, but I'm making this comment like separately as a, a private individual, um, for whatever that's worth. So I wanted to say that um, my, so my fiance and I, we moved to Norwalk about six years ago so we could live together, but also keep our jobs in uh, Greenwich and New Britain. 
And uh, despite our really awful commutes, we really just love East Norwalk a lot. We really love calf pasture. We love walking down our block and seeing boats and sunsets and kids playing soccer at Vets Park. We're, uh, we're even doing something that seems impossible right now, but we're in the process of buying a house, a uh, bigger house in East Norwalk because we really want to stay here for all the next parts of our lives and get some more roots here. Um, my involvement in the TOD process started when we saw a sign by the drawbridge um, that said that there was a TOD vis visioning session and we were like, what is that? That sounds exciting. And despite the fact that it was really, really early on a weekend, we stopped by the Duncan on East Avenue and we went to town hall. And that first session was actually really cool and really hopeful and exciting. And it was great being asked what our favorite parts of East Norwalk were and what we wanted East Norwalk to be. And even being asked to just dream about what it could be was, was really exciting. The, the exercises were interesting and the residents provided incredibly granular feedback on the things that they liked and that they didn't like and they, things they wished the city could have. We heard a, a detailed listing of where everyone wants stop signs specifically, but I feel like that's just part of this and everyone's got the thing that they're interested in. Into the, uh, the second and third sessions, things, um, things started getting kind of disappointing. We were, we were thought that we had been listened to at first and we thought that all the input that we gave you know, as a whole community would be taken back and incorporated into a report for the plan. We thought that all the big word clouds that said grocery store and sidewalks and less traffic in the middle and the big word clouds for no big buildings and no more density. We thought those things were being recorded and taking into account. And we thought the nice exercise about where would you like to bike? We thought all those things actually meant something. But when the plan came out, we were really surprised to see that all it seemed to recommend was changing zoning to allow bigger apartment buildings and higher density if we wanted to have even a hope of getting better sidewalks or bike lanes or attracting a grocery store. Um, all, the, all the drafts of the plan that I've seen, and I've, I've attended many of the oversight committee meetings, I've read all these documents several times, they all show just a really big lack of interdisciplinary work between the different parts of the city. By that, I mean the fact that residents clearly really want certain types of stores and they want a reduction in traffic and improved parking and greater connection between the different parts of the city. And there's, there's no page in the plan that says, you know, hey, we're studying how to attract a grocery store to the TOD area through a, you know, through any, any tool that we have. There's no page in the plan that says that we're experimenting with different types of public transit or temporary bike lanes to reduce traffic between the highway and the beach. There's no creativity whatsoever really in how do we get the residents what they want. These examples are really just to highlight that the residents did come out and told the city what they wanted but because this is only a zoning exercise that's the only tool that was applied when we really deserve more innovative work here in East Norwalk. Um, aside from the big disconnect that I see between what people said they wanted and what the plan recommends, I also noticed that the city doesn't really seem to care about the tiny amount of public involvement that we're actually getting. This whole fiasco last week with Zoom links for the public hearing being changed and not you know, being re-released with much time before the meeting is just a, a really sad example of barely just checking the box of public engagement. Uh, what really made me think about this lately is that I saw a tremendous number of Instagram and Facebook posts from the city begging people to come and report the storm damage they saw from the recent tropical storm and I've seen posts about ice cream day and you know everything on earth from the city and things on Norwalk Now and other city related media sites, but I've seen I mean, minimal posts. I can't even think of a post that I've seen on social media from the city about the TOD study, what it is, and most importantly, how to get involved and why. And if it weren't for that electronic sign thing that we saw on that bridge, we, I would not have joined in this at all. I really just consider the attempts by the city to reach out and to gain public participation to be really unacceptably low. Uh, it really feels like the city is taking advantage of the lack of involvement of the residents and that 
we're trying to keep it that way to get plans that they like through. Um, also worth noting is that I'm, I'm not actually opposed to the plan. I don't hate the density and height and scope of it. I've just been paying attention and spending a lot of time in that process. And I don't, and I, these are the things that I'm seeing through it. Um, in closing, I, I will say that Steve Kleppen and the Oversight Committee and really everyone at the city and the cult consultants included that I spoke to have really been very responsive to the questions I've asked. They all exhibit an extreme level of patience when getting asked the same question 30 times in one meeting. And I really do appreciate that. And I appreciate that we live in a city that wants to improve itself and does plans like this and exercises like this. But in my opinion, the way that we arrived at this plan and the public engagement and support and the outreach that the city did to gain that is, is really questionable at best. And that's all I've got. So thank you. Hey, Megan, did you see the, the brief presentation that Steve gave at the very beginning as far as uh, the 2018, how many meetings and how many um, public uh, engagement forums and whatever? I did not, no. Steve, you gonna pop that chart up again? Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, and just if, if I could just respond quickly to that. Um, so having done this for a while now and done this in different communities, the, the and I'm, I'm sure there'll be people that disagree, but the turnout we had at the public meetings that were, you know, the, the workshop types that we had, you know, obviously pre-COVID, were really well attended. And even the consultants remarked how well they were attended. And, and you know, we did things, I, you know, I, I wish I had somebody on staff that could do social media posts and boosts all the time, but it's not, you know, not that we don't have the staff for that all the time. Unfortunately, that's the case, but, you know, we did other things too. We went out and we put flyers and pretty much every business that would let us put them, put them out. We had cards that we handed out at the train station. We had different people handing out flyers, did different things like that. So. I think we went above and beyond to try to reach out to people. And, and I think that showed in the number of people that attended. And also, if you look at the, the YouTube videos from the presentations we've had, just go back and look at the number of people who watched these compared to any of the other town meetings, whether it's uh, council, zoning commission, finance, whoever it is. You know, it, you know, obviously there's a big level of interest in this area, but the number of people paying attention to this is vastly superior to any of those those outreach efforts i i mean i think the numbers are just they're just there we, you know we've, we've gone out we've presented we've talked and talked and talked so i think that we've done that i mean unfortunately sometimes the the you know if a zoom link isn't working that time we try to fix it right away we don't try not trying to mislead anybody or point them in the wrong direction we we try to correct that as soon as it, that comes to light so that that that's all i have to say Okay, thank you, uh, Brian. Next. All right, we have Jim P. You just need to say your last name and your address when you come over. Hi, good evening. This is Jim Papadakos from Cloverly Circle. Thank Thanks. you for the opportunity to speak and appreciate everybody's um, willingness to have these presentations for everyone. So I'll be relatively brief. I have been a resident of East Norwalk for 46 years. Uh, unlike some that have spoken this evening, I have spent all of those years directly in the TOD area. I have no business interest in East Norwalk. I'm just a resident who wants to raise a family and enjoy the amenities of the area. While I agree East Avenue is in need of assistance, I would call out that the area south of the East Norwalk Cemetery is arguably the most walkable area of Norwalk. Anybody who wants to argue that just needs to come down here any day of the week and see families and children walking their kids and their dogs and bike riding in this beautiful area. This is despite being an already heavily trafficked area as residents across Norwalk come to enjoy the many amenities of the area, including Veterans Park, Waterfront Dining, Calf Pasture and Shady Beach, Marinas and Taylor Farm. 
the current plan calls for a doubling of density. And I question what percent of the people that actually live in the area being impacted have signed off on it. Adding that type of density on top of an area that's already busy in terms of roads risks the walkability of the neighborhood and increases the dangers of the pedestrians and the residents. By all means, I think focusing on East Avenue is something that should be done, but I would not support any additional development in an area that is primarily residential with more apartment building. Also, I would say that please don't discount the voices of the people that live in the area and are directly impacted by this plan. This is our neighborhood, these are our homes, uh, and please don't value the voices of those that are living in far-flung areas of the city over those that live directly in the areas impacted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got no one raising their hand. If you want to go to written. Oh, he's got a written hand. Uh, so Vicki, I'll bring you over. Just make sure you say your last name and address for us. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Vicki Roos. I live at 17 Pine Hill Avenue. Um, I do have a few concerns about this zoning approval. Uh, just quickly, the Wells Fargo, I think I know because that's probably slated to be the first of one of these developments um, is an issue for me. It's not far from where I live. Um, I'm concerned about how high it's going to be because of the slope. And if they're gonna somehow, you know, do the three and a half stories at the top of East Avenue, or is it gonna be at the bottom of Cemetery Street? So that could be a big concern. Um, I know that that's slated for about 87 units, which is a lot. And I don't know if there's gonna be an individual traffic study, but is that going to need another traffic light? We've already have so many traffic lights um, in a, under a half a mile radius. Um, and I know there's an issue, or there has always been an issue with the soil uh, at the mill pond. So if they're gonna start digging and you're gonna have to have some soil testing because the mill pond is very fragile. And that's where the, all the mercury runoff came from the Hat Corporation. And who knows if that's 100% cleaned up or not, or once they start digging, it's gonna stir some mercury up and there's gonna be some big issues. And then there's gonna be like an undeveloped uh, POCO, Oh, development or lo another Lowman's Plaza development sitting there for years. Big concern. Um, of course, traffic. I know everybody complains about the traffic because it is a real thing. People are not just saying it to complain. It's a huge issue. There are six traffic lights in under a half a mile to get from Winfield to, the, to 95. There's literally traffic on every corner. Uh, Winfield, Fitch, Myrtle, Raymond Terrace, the northbound on-ramp, the southbound on-ramp. It's, it's, and if you're gonna add another traffic light, that's the only improvement that I've heard about this plan was to add another traffic light at um, Fort Point. So now we're talking about seven traffic lights and maybe if there's another one at Cemetery Street because of more, more units, we're talking about maybe eight traffic lights. And I, I want to remind everyone about the bridge at the train station. Once that street is lowered, tractor trailers are going to be using that all the time. Right now, we sort of have a little gateway into the lower part of East, of, uh, East Noah. Tractor trailers cannot come through here. Once that's lowered, it's going to be a total nightmare. One tractor trailer will take up a whole entire block. <laughs> no cars will be able to move anywhere. So adding one traffic light is not gonna help. Lowering that bridge, adding tractor trailers, another huge issue. And I don't know how you can call it a village district when you're going to be allowing tractor trailers. There is not a lot of outlets in and out of East Norwalk. We have the Straffolino Bridge, uh, Strawberry Hill, uh, East Avenue, and then otherwise you have to go to Westport to get out of here. That's it. Once the construction starts, this could be for years. And the way the zoning is currently in Norwalk, this is my concern because you just look around Norwalk and you will develop and overdevelop anything. <laughs> so it's, that's another concern. And who knows how many, how long this is going to go on for. It could go on for years. Currently, East Norwalk is a shining example of a working class community. 
we don't need fake facades and rooftop bars to be viable. It is viable. Yeah, there are some issues, but we don't need cut and paste development from South Noah, from West Avenue to Water Street over here, just to make it viable. There are viable businesses. You're talking about getting rid of viable businesses. You're talking about banks. We were, there's no banks. Wells Fargo is going to be gone. Bank of America is gone. You're talking about getting rid of gas stations <laughs> that everyone uses every day. So this is why people have concerns and issues because you are not listening to people that actually live here. Overdevelopment is not the answer. It's not always the answer. I, you need to reconsider the density. Um, overdevelopment affects everybody, everything. Traffic, school, water, sewage, garbage, snow, electricity, noise pollution, light pollution, wildlife, the community, and just all around uh, quality of life. You, ha you have to consider the infrastructure of this tiny neighborhood. These tiny streets cannot accommodate tractor trailer trucks and all of this traffic, be it foot traffic. Even if you have a thousand units and the people don't have cars, they're gonna be walking. It's just going to be way too many people and way too much traffic. And this, it's a tiny community. You have to rethink it. That's it, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um... If anyone wants to speak, you can still use the raise your hand feature or you can dial star nine. If not, we'll go over to written comments. Uh, Cheryl, if you just want to say your last name and address. Cheryl, you just have to unmute yourself. That would help, right? There you go. Okay, so the name is Cheryl Warner. I'm at Cove Avenue. I've lived in East Norwalk for 25 years and lived in South Norwalk growing up. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak to you. I've been attending meetings of ENNA since its inception. In 2018 and in 2019, I spend a number of days providing input to P&Z in regard to what we would like to see in the TOD area of East Norwalk. I viewed this time that I spent there very, as very important because I was very disappointed with the handling of the development of the former hat factory at 230 East Avenue. It wasn't even included in the TOD and it's right next to the eastbound train station. And again, 189 units, and we'll see how many cars. I've read about the lovely amenities that this plan will provide via the developers, parks, park benches, rain walls, possibly a promenade by Seaview. And all of this is an exchange for the de developers to have increased building heights from 2.5 stores to 3.5, which of course increases rental density. Last week, Mrs. Ms. Innes of Harriman spoke of the increase to 3.5 stories. She said it was better to build 3.5 floors with cupolas than have a flat roof. So on a 2.5 store building, you could have a flat roof. What's the problem with it? If you build a flat roof and you put a spine or a rafter the length of it, it becomes slightly pitched, which allows the water to drain appropriately. And you can finish the building off with a pitch facade on the front. The building doesn't require 3.5 stories. Only the developer wants to provide more rental units. The amenities in the plan are nice. I also like the current wonderful laundromat, which I've used. Efficient machines, clean, well-maintained, mobile station, my favorite place, and the restaurant and the ice cream place that are already here. In terms of the amenities that are talked about in the plan, they're only provided if the developer is eligible for bonuses. That's from page 11 to 13 of the plan. They, the developer earn points for providing them in exchange, 
the height and density of a building can be increased. Residential density can be increased. If they have 20 points above, again, the height can be increased. Lot area per dwelling unit may be decreased from 1650 square feet to 825. Far may be increased from 0 0.7 to 1.5. Maximum building area may be increased to 80% for buildings and parking, but at whose expense? Although it has been stated there are no developers or plans of yet, we all know in reality that there are developers that look at land and they look around at areas, so they are there. Um, they're waiting in the rings and they are wings and they are probably hoping that the 3.5 stories will become reality because it's more economically feasible for them. They make more money. East Norwalk will have increased rental units, increased cars, increased traffic. And at this point, the roads in the area have trouble handling current traffic. I would like to see us wait and observe how the additional traffic from 230 East Avenue affects our current traffic. And what is the plan for that increased traffic? I know in attending the meetings at 230 East Avenue, they said that they were going to exit on Osborne Avenue and that Osborne Avenue would be modified. That, that probably won't happen for a while, that they were not coming out on East Avenue. So not sure about that. If this is a good plan, and I think there's many parts of it that are good, there is no reason to rush to move it forward. One question that I have not heard, how is this incorporated into the city master plan? I think there needs to be a moratorium on moving the plan to the common council. Number one, to observe how the 230 East Avenue um, at factory building impacts traffic. How does it fit in the city's master plan? And where are we really going? I'm not against apartments or building or improvement. I think some of the ideas that are in the master plan that you, the plan you've presented, I like a lot of them, but I don't want to rush through and then look back and say, we've overdeveloped and we've impacted an area that has like four clubs, marinas, our beach, which is, if you've been there this summer, if you don't get there by 9.30, um, your parking is at a minimum. So when we spoke about 230 East Avenue, I felt that we were ignored. And I fear as a taxpayer that I, along with my fellow taxpayers, are being thrown under the bus, driven by developers. And I'd like planning and zoning in your position to take a look at what those of us who live in love East Norwalk see going forward. Like I said, I, I, I see the plans, I see your ideas, but I really need more concrete information so that once, if the plan goes through is now, there's too many ins and outs that could be avoided in trying to make East Norwalk even better than it is now. Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, thank you. So if anyone still wants to speak, you could use the raise your hand function or star nine. And if not, we'll go to written. All right. Hold, hold on, uh, Steve, do you want to address any of how it gets folded into the master plan or uh, where sure. I, I can. So the so really what the, the commission is voting on in actuality is the amendment to the master plan itself, the, the, which is the citywide plan. The citywide plan, if you read it, it does recommend many things that we're talking about in this plan. It, it obviously does not get into the specifics about going from two and a half stories to three and a half stories or anything like that, but it it strongly recommends increased density at the train station. And specifically within the citywide plan, it, it references this pending TOD plan. So it knew it was coming. So it, I think there's a very clear link there. And I think what we're proposing is in 
uh, complete alignment with that. We've recommended several tweaks to the citywide plan to incorporate this plan by reference, so that way that, that document can stand on its own, and this document is incorporated to the citywide plan, and there's a nexus between the two. Okay, Brian, you want to go to the uh, emails? Yeah, we got two more people who raise their hands, unless you want to go to written for now, Fran. No, no, I'll go to the uh, people who want to speak. All right, so we have Frank. Uh, Frank, I just need you to say your last name and your address when you come over. Hi, my name is uh, Frank Ciano. I live on 2nd Street here in East Norwalk. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I emailed in some comments earlier. And, you know, I think a lot of other people have said a lot of the things I feel better than I could say them. But, you know, I, I would just wanted to say I'm a, I'm a long life resident. I was born here on Cove Ave. Um, I just, you know, I got married, decided to buy a house uh, about three blocks away from where I grew up uh, because I love East Norwalk so much. And I wanted to raise a family, you know, where I was raised, which I love so much. And, uh, you know, I think no one's in disagreement that East Norwalk needs some updating. You know, there's certain areas that need some, some upgrades. And, you know, we all agree, uh, it's, you know, it, it's not that we don't need to do things because we do need to do things. But you guys have laid out a grand plan and it looks great on paper, uh, but it looks great on paper for numbers, for finance numbers, for developers, uh, not for people like me who've been here all my life. You know, my parents paid taxes. I pay taxes here. I enjoy the community. You know, I, I love this place. This is home. And, uh, and, you know, you guys are proposing a lot of, lot of things. You know, it's, uh, it's like, it's all or nothing with you guys in this plan. You know, there's no medium ground. There's no middle ground. You know, how about we all just agree on, you know, what you want to go three and a half stories? Well, you know, two stories is fine or whatever it is, you know, um, it, it just seems like every single citizen and resident here that's talking, none of us want this plan or not at the extent that you guys are presenting it, uh, but no one's listening. I mean, I don't know anyone who's like, yeah, I love that plan. Let's go with it a hundred percent. I mean, not one person who you talk to wants this plan as you guys are presenting it. And it, it's just kind of funny that no one's really listening and, you know, going back to the drawing table and saying, listen, let's do things that make you guys happy and us. I mean, listen, I want a better neighborhood. Let's do it. I'm all for that. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Um, but you know, the plan you guys have is extreme and we don't want extreme. You know, we want to keep Snorlock beautiful the way it is, the way it should be. And, uh, you know, we don't want to become Stanford. We don't want to become South Norwalk. We want to be East Norwalk. This is who we are. And, you know, let's try to preserve that, keep that. And, uh, and like I said, I'm going to spare all the things everyone else has already said because they're all valid and I don't need to say them again. But, you know, I will say that I think it's important that you guys actually listen to us as citizens and residents of this town of East Norwalk. You know, we live here. You guys don't live here. And I don't know if any of you do, but, you know, I'm here and everyone I know that lives here feels the same way I do. And, you know, rather than rush this through on Zoom meetings during a pandemic and COVID, you know, let's wait it off and let's wait till we can meet face to face and let's agree, you know, there's plenty of things we can decide on and make this, you know, area of Norwalk way better than it is. And let's do it, let's do it together, but let's not rush through a plan that 99% of us residents don't agree on. So, um, you know, I could talk all night, but I won't. And I, I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to listen to me. Okay, thank you. I'll just say that two of the uh, commissioners do leave it, do live in uh, East Norwalk. All right, uh, next we have Jesse. Jesse, can you come over to say your last name and address for us? Hi there, everyone. My name is Jesse McGarty and I live at 10 Branford Street in East Norwalk. I'm actually just about a block away from the Wells Fargo uh, property. Um, I can almost say ditto to the other folks that spoke about East Norwalk. Uh, first, I want to say thank you all for the time and energy you put into the plans. However, if I'm to be brutally honest, I've attended many of the meetings. I've done, this is now my like third Zoom meeting. Um, I was at City Hall and went to all the planning meetings and played all the games where we wrote everything down and everyone was very excited about the improvements. But to be honest, we feel like we are not really heard. And when we did share our opinions that it wasn't really taken into consideration. And, and I'm sorry, because I know everybody's working hard on this. However, this is my home. This is our community. 
And so I feel like we need to be as, you know, forthright as possible because we all want to be happy where we live. I'm sure you can all agree with that. Um, yes, we'd like to see um, East Norwalk going from exit 16 down towards the beach nicer than it is. But nicer does not mean to the residents, at least the ones that I've spoken to, and there have been many, doesn't mean bigger and more dense and more traffic and more overdevelopment. I love Norwalk. I moved here from New York City. If I wanted that busyness, I would have stayed in New York. The reason why I chose East Norwalk and love it so much is that it is this you know, more quiet section of town with the beach within walking distance. And we cherish that here in this neighborhood. If we wanna enjoy a little bit more nightlife and restaurants and all of that, we go to South Norwalk and that's great. It's, you know, it's nearby, but it's not in our backyard. Here we want it to be a little bit more quiet, a little bit more laid back, more family friendly. And while the sidewalks could most definitely be better, you can walk around East Norwalk for the most part. I do it every morning. Um, there are families out with their children in strollers. There are people riding bikes. Yes, it can be improved upon, but it is possible. And with the density that you're proposing, the traffic will come with it. The traffic is tough as it is right now, especially in the warmer months with everyone going down to either Vets Park or certainly to the beach, but it's doable. I cannot imagine with these you know, larger proposed apartments, never mind the 230 East Avenue um, building, which hasn't even been um, inhabited yet, you know, it's going to be crazy. The schools are already <laughs> completely packed, you know, and, and lacking in so much. I can't imagine that these apartments that are proposed, I know they're gearing towards a lot of young people, but, you know, with young people comes <laughs> children. So we have to consider that and think ahead. So my concern is, will our neighborhood still have this cozy, beachy, laid back feel. If we have 800 and something apartments in the Wells Fargo parcel, as it is now, I'll be honest with you, I'm right on the mill pond uh, during the winter months when the trees, the deciduous trees lose their leaves, I'm looking at a bunch of lights on the back of that bank, which I'm not thrilled about, but that is gonna be nothing in comparison to what I will be looking at when there's a big structure and an apartment building there or whatever else you know we're allowing if we in fact do this height increase and um you know the increase of all these apartments that would be there i would love to see a little supermarket i would love to see the promenade area that you guys are talking about you know i do agree with the um, forgive me i don't recall his name but the gentleman who spoke right before me where yes we need these improvements. I don't think anyone is disagreeing with that. East Avenue can definitely look better than the way it does now. But can we find a middle ground? Can we find a way to make it better without going so far as what we're talking about here in these plans? I would love to hear more about that. And then also, I'm sure for us in East Norwalk, we would appreciate if those things would truly be considered because then we would feel like our voices were really heard. Thank you so much for your time. And I do appreciate the work you've put into this. And I, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we can come to a really good outcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, um, we have Anna Tavichnik. Sorry if I mispronounced that. One second, honey. Hi, my name is Anna Tavashnik. I live um, on Myrtle Street between East and uh, Strawberry Hill. And I just wanted to say that I, that I looked at this plan, I looked at the master plan and then the amendment plan, and it all looks great to me. Um, I think, and honestly, I'm just like, you know, uh, I didn't hear every talk, I heard most people talk, and um, the representations that 99% of people don't want this or all of East Norwalk hates this. I mean, I think the people who come to these types of meetings tend to be people that are against um, these types of developments. I, the first thing I thought 
seen the Bank of America site was that there should be apartments here. I uh, had no problem with the parking. It's a beautiful neighborhood. It could use some improvements. It could use better sidewalks. It could use better amenities for young families. Um, and I think reading your plan, it seems like you're taking the character of the neighborhood into account and trying to keep things pretty small. So I don't know if there's a better way to get feedback from the community than Zoom meetings where you can hear more people. That's my daughter. Um, but I just wanted to give a little perspective that that, that not everybody feels this way. Um, and some people are in, in support of more development in this area that's not um, extreme, but does continue the forward motion. So thank you for all you're doing. Bye. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have, uh, I just wanna check if Steve is there. Steve had mentioned that City Hall lost power and their generator kicked on. You there, Steve? Uh, yeah, I can't, I don't know if we're on generator or we're back on, but I, I'm slowly coming back into the technology realm, so. Okay, all right, so next uh, we have Tracy Barkley. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Tracy Barkley. I'm on Cove Avenue. I have a couple of, um, first of all, as a East Norwalk resident for 15 years, I am not against, I, or I, I don't want to be portrayed, and I think my, my fellow residents feel the same. We do not want to be portrayed as we are against the plan. Um, our concerns are the extremes of the plan. Um, we have felt a little skeptical as some of the things that we have seen the city do. Um, the shopping center that burned down and was built up beautifully has now become another eyesore surrounded by chain link fence. Um, the Winfield Street side of that property is overgrown with plants in the parking lot that is that you know, services that's behind their service doors. Um, we see things that the city has not um, promised, such as not putting a parking lot in front of the apartment buildings next to Dunkin' Donuts, but it, it went through. Uh, developers knocked down that beautiful brick building on the corner of Water Street and uh, Washington Street, oh, accidentally, um, because they were able to get away with it. So you'll have to excuse some of our skepticism that the plans as presented would actually come to fruition exactly as, uh, as they are shown. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about any, uh, I, I, share, I share so many of the other um, speakers, especially Cheryl, if I could have written my thoughts, they would probably mirror her speaking. Uh, so I won't duplicate those. I have to say I would implore the committee to hold off on big decisions until we see some of the impact that the Yankee Doodle Bridge construction, the Strawberry Hill construction is going to do to the cut through traffic to East Norwalk we are gonna see a huge amount of um, increase in traffic with that. Then we move to the walk bridge and commuters trying to drive between Westport and South Norwalk. Uh, anybody who's traveling from north of East Norwalk and north on a train, once that bridge starts, that bridge construction starts, um, I just wanna shake my head at the thought of what it's gonna seem like. Um, I have watched the Straffolino Bridge get stuck on so many times, so many times on such strange hours of the day, and render us landlocked. Um, I I think also I was Monday on that bridge, and during rush hour, the bridge went up for a very small vessel, a fishing boat, at nine o'clock in the morning or eight fifty-five. AM and created havoc with the traffic. So I, I feel like the city isn't exactly 
concerned as much as we are about the traffic that we are um, destined to experience here in the short term. Um, and so I really want to see the, the committee put a delay on making any decisions about this. And one other comment about the promenade. It is impossible to safely navigate from Veterans Park to the beach with kids on bicycles as part of any sort of promenade, having to make that S turn around from Veterans Park along, I guess that Sea View to First Street, passing the East Norwalk Boat Club, uh, Harbor Lights, Overton's, Mr. Frosty's. It is such a mess. And I don't believe a promenade could possibly work there. So I really would like the TOD committee to fully explain what the thoughts are behind that. I, um, I, j I just cannot conceive of a way possible that that would work. And, um, but, but mostly we are horrified at the thought of what these projects um, for the bridges are going to do to our traffic. And so we just ask that before you approve any other larger residential units that you allow us to absorb and, and witness and react to what we're going to see here in the very near future. And thank you for listening and your time. Thank you. Uh, Steve, you want to address any of the points? On you, Steve. Steve, mute. You're muted. Can you unmute him? There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now we can. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry about that. Um, if you can, if you have specific issues you want me to speak to, I'm, I'm happy to do so. The, the one I, I, she spoke to at the end about the promenade. So there is land there um, between the park space and the street. What this plan does and what this plan does in many areas, it, it doesn't have to provide like the final engineering solution for something that we have to look at that at a later point. So the plan is introducing that as a, what we think is a good idea that will benefit the entire city. Um, I, I saw some comments in the thread in there, you know, that no, we didn't want to live in a city. Well, Norwalk is a city. East Norwalk's not a, you know, municipality amongst itself. It's part of a much larger collective. And I think that's an issue I, we saw when we were putting the citywide plan together is all these, the idea is to try to connect these areas into one fabric. So when we talk about, you know, massive scale, you know, if we were doing a full TOD build out, you know, it would look completely different than what we're talking about here. We, when we went into this, one of the core things we talked about at the very beginning of the process was how, the, you know, we understand that East Norwalk is a much different area than other parts of the city. It's not South Norwalk. It's not, you know, it's not West Ave Wall Street. So that's why we've proposed densities and heights that are, you know, less than half what you could do there. So we think we've put together a reasonable approach to get things done. You know, we, the city can go ahead and improve sidewalks and add lighting, but we can't compel somebody to put a grocery store in. You know, that's not how the market works. The market's dictated by, you know, demand and a desire for a, a typical business to be there. We, you know, I, I talked to Trader Joe's before. I talked to one of their um, real estate arms about how, when we were looking at something in South Norwalk. And, and Everything is based on numbers and, and availability for them. It's not based on the city recruiting them to come there. Now that that I, I recognize that there was an earlier speaker said you know that the plan doesn't specifically lay out a strategy to do that, but it talks about the city needing to do that, and that's what we'll do. It it doesn't lay out the specific strategy, but that's why we have an economic development and a tourism office to put those kind of recommendations together. We'd love to get those kind of amenities that people want, but we can't zone someone to put a specific use in. That's not how, how it works. If there's any other items, I, I'll address that or I can pick up comments at a later well, can point. You, can you say anything about the, um, uh, the area next to the laundromat there, right? The burnt down area, right? It went on for years, we're sitting there. Now it's, 
What's, do you know anything uh, over there? What's going on? I do not. We've reached out to that landowner very early on in the process and were unsuccessful. That, that's not a city issue. The city's not holding him up or preventing him from doing anything. So I just point that out for the record. We're not, we're not always the bad guy. Okay, so there's no... Uh... The thing with the, you know, you got the fences back up, uh, the overgrowth stuff, whatever. There's nothing that uh, your office can look into or no? If there, unless there's a blight issue at the moment, there's not a zoning issue holding them up from doing something on that property. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian, where are we? Uh, so we just have Sarah. I'll bring you over and then if you just want to state your last Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so I just, I'm speaking, I am on the board for the NNA, but I'm speaking just as myself, regular citizen. Sarah, Sarah, what's, your, what's your last name and where you live? Last name is Hunter and I live on Schofield Place. Sarah Hunter. Thank you. So sure, just speaking as myself, not, not any group. Um, I think it's important just to reiterate that even though you've heard over and over tonight, many people, and you've heard the statement regarding other people and what they've said that we don't, I'm gonna say I myself also feel as if, even though I've made a huge effort to participate in all of the, you know, in the workshops and the Zoom meetings and what have you, it still feels as if, uh, you know, and this is what others have said as well, not really being heard um, in terms of wanting some, you know, give and take and collaboration around the fact that we all feel this is, we all, everyone I've heard with the exception of one, feels that this is um, just too much. It's, it's too much development. It's not that we don't want to do, you know, it's not that I want nothing. It's certainly not that uh, I don't recognize the hard work that's gone into it, but it does feel as if our voices are not being heard in terms of somebody with a response saying, okay, let's talk about the density and how we find a middle ground that works. Or yes, we've heard that, you know, your inputs over and over were around, I'm just going to say city gardens or whatever they were, as opposed to saying, you know, a, a promenade or something that might not have come from residents. I think there was someone who spoke earlier named Frank who said, really that we love East Norwalk and it's so true. We do, we came here for different reasons. I've been here 25 years and it almost feels as if there's a slightly disparaging view of what we have instead of improving on what we have, sort of a let's change it all. And that's where I feel uh, a little hurt that, that those of us who live here and everything that everybody has said tonight, whether you know they could walk to the beach or not, or are quieter, you know, not city, not New York City way of life, really want to be heard on those facts and, and really would like it if we could get a little more collaboration from the city instead of um, rushing this through so that, so that we know we are being heard. And that's, that's what I wanted to say. Frank, okay. can I respond to that one? Yeah, respond to whenever you want to jump in. Okay. So I'm sure, oh, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, I wanted to address this, I, I, I meant to before, but so, and a couple speakers brought this up and, and I agree with them how the process unfolded. So we, like as I mentioned, we had, there were three you know, public meetings, uh, you know, pre-COVID where everybody got in the room and there was sitting around tables doing exercises and so forth. And the first meeting, and Emily Ennis, who was here with us last time, spoke about this as well. There was more, you know, there, there was, and yeah, obviously there still is strong sentiment, we don't want any more residential development. I hear that in different areas of the city all the time. I, 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 I got the message, we understand what you're saying. Um, I think the tone of the, the meetings changed though over time, where I, I think even we got to the last one, there was, I think it was about 50-50 of people who, who were supporting what we were proposing. Now, maybe others don't agree with that, but that's, that's what we took out of that. So when we start taking that input in, and this is getting to how we get from the first meeting to what we actually recommend, 
we start looking at things and we, we hear what people want and they desire. And they, you know, they want these, you know, the, the buildings to be better, better. They want the, the developments to, you know, be improved where they have places to congregate, where there's more green space, there's seating areas. And, and then the thought is, well, why don't you just require that? Well, it's not always that simple. The zoning regulations can't simply just mandate things. So we have the East Avenue that, you know, kind of view shed that I took you down at the beginning of the meeting. That's what it looks like today under today's regulations. And I think the reason it looks that way today is because the regulations don't provide any incentive for anybody to improve those properties. Now, like I said, the city can improve by putting new sidewalks in and put street lighting in, but it's not gonna make anybody want to improve their property necessarily. And the economic analysis that was done, and I lost all my tabs I had open or I would refer back to it. I, I don't, can't remember if it's the second or third appendice as part of the plan, which was the report by RKG. And that was the subconsultant to Harriman on this. And go through and read their analysis. They tell you why you're not gonna get what you desire for this area along East Avenue is because the regulations don't permit any or have any incentive for people to improve their property. It's laid out in there, you can see that. That's why we propose what we proposed. You know, as I mentioned, if we were going to do a full TOD, you know, plan like we would do in other areas around a mass transit station, it would be a lot higher and a lot denser than what we're proposing. In my opinion, this is the compromise plan. This is the measured tactical plan that is the balance between a full TOD plan and a balance between the neighborhood. And looking at this picture here, if you can follow my mouse, the, the yellow circle is the entire plan area. The area we're actually proposing to change, which is the, really the East Avenue corridor, is a half mile stretch that goes down from the cemetery to 95. All these great neighborhoods, Cove Ave. I, Cove Avenue, I've said this a dozen times, is one of my favorite areas in the entire city. First street down through there, it's, it's got such a unique feel. We don't want to change any of that. We want to protect it and, and enhance it. We're not proposing any changes through there. The area we really think is lacking, that's really dragging down everything else is East Avenue. And there's a reason why there are vacant shops and vacant storefronts, is because there's no people visiting there. It's not an area where people want to walk. It's not a very friendly area. Whereas you get into Cove and First, for example, example, or go down to Liberty Square, it's a completely different feel. You want to walk there and you want to be there. But East Avenue doesn't offer that. And we hope we put a plan together that offers that. Uh, there were a couple questions in the chat about road improvements, and I might as well just hit those now if that's okay. So part of the road improvements that are proposed is we talked about the bridge widening and that going to four lanes. East Avenue, the road is going to align so you're not shifting from left to right just to go straight down East Avenue. And there's going to be a new light at Fitch Street, which will be timed. So all the lights along East Avenue will be timed similar to what they did on West Avenue, which will allow a better flow of traffic from point A to point B. So we understand and acknowledge that there are going to be more cars. If more people come to the air, there is going to be more traffic. But we're hoping that the flow of traffic improves through that corridor. OK, Brian. All right, uh, we are down to written comments. So I don't know, if Steve, if you want to pick out Go through those ones, um, ones that you haven't addressed yet, or however you want to do it. Uh, sure. Let me let me pull them up. There was one that I'll try to go back and see. You know what, Brian? You might need to do this. I'm happy to answer them if you could read the questions because when my when I lost power, my Zoom lost all the questions that were pre-lost power, so I can't read anything off the old ones. All right, so um, going back to um, when we opened the meeting, uh, Lou Garcia, um, this first one's more of a comment. I'll read his question. Uh, why can we keep this, why can we keep the stories to two and a half and the FAR if not to allow future developers to build more units and taller? Yeah, I, I'll try to answer that as I'm not quite sure. Um, Oh, I just see them pop back, pop back in on the comments. But yeah, so the, the reason we are proposing a little, additional, a little additional density, a little more height, 
and a little more FAR is to let them improve their properties. As I mentioned, right now there's no incentive for anybody to improve their properties. Two and a half stories, it just doesn't work. I'm, you know, that's just the reality of why East Avenue is the way it is. All right. Um, Donna Schlegel asked a question about traffic that you just kind of addressed, so I'll move on from that one. Um, uh, Kimberly Ann Bastoni, she says, um, I support ENNA and believe we are overdeveloping. This includes the Bank of America space, 17 units on that space, three stories with parking underneath. I would like to propose we delay making a decision for one year. This is not a question, but a request. Hey, Brian, yeah, do you have so addresses? When you read the name, please read the address. All right, a lot of them did not provide addresses. We put that request yeah, just, in. Just, Go ahead. Sorry, friend. Go ahead, friend. No, no, we requested names and addresses as any other public hearing, but if they have a full name, I'll allow it for now. Go ahead. Well, yeah, my only comment to that was, and it, not to get into the application too much, but the 93 Winfield Street application, where actually the plan proposes to rezone that to a residential zone uh, from the uh, current neighborhood business and I think if anybody's seen the plans versus what we're proposing I think that's one of the reasons we're putting this plan together is to adopt standards and guidelines so we'll get a development that's you know people will like not versus what the regulations allow so as opposed to being reactive we're being proactive all right um, she continued and said um, still Kimberly um, she says, how do we extend making decisions on all these plans? We are in a critical place with COVID and getting full support of the residents is difficult. What do we need to do to get a delay? Uh, that, you know, the votes ultimately up to the commission. My two cents is you're, I think this format actually lets people talk in a more productive manner sometimes than, than the large groups. Not to say that the large groups for the initial part of the plan aren't better, but for this, everybody's getting a chance to speak and everybody has, you know, if you could say, well, some people don't have access to Zoom. Well, some people can't get to a city hall meeting at seven o'clock. This allows them the freedom to do it from home. Like the, the woman who spoke who had kids, she might not have been able to come out to a meeting because she has kids at home. Now I'm gonna say what I said at the beginning of the meeting. Um, as far as people can also call in, you don't have to be on Zoom, right? You can be on the phone. Yeah. I mentioned that, uh, so it can just be a plain listening and speaking on the phone. But I mentioned that the governor's um, update came out. It comes out every day. This came out uh, for the weekend. Since Friday, there were 459 new cases of COVID. So the virus is here. We're dealing with it the best we can. And uh, I'm gonna to say to all, as having been through the virus and having survived it, Zoom is the, these types of meeting, it's allowing a lot of people to interact, interchange, you know, and uh, we are where we are. Okay, next. All right. Uh, um, we had uh, Ken Prince Jr. He says he's lived in East Norwalk since 1976. Currently, he lives at Fenwick Place. Um, he says the bank is in my backyard. There's no way a development, as I understand we are talking about, will not have a negative impact on this neighborhood. Why not restore the marsh and brook buried by the lot and develop a few 50 by 125 or 150 foot lots? That pond now has a multitude of wildlife that would benefit if you restored that marsh. Well, I, I think it's safe to say that any any redevelopment on that site, whether the regulations get changed or not, are going to improve that property. Because right now, if you take a overhead look at it, it's basically a sea of asphalt, which A, it's not a very good use of the property, and B, it's just not good for rain, drainage and runoff towards the pond or anything else. So if you look at what we propose for the regulations, there's going to be vast improvements to the drainage and surface water runoff that go from that site. So I think it, it would be a win-win either way. All right. Um, this was from Kimberly Ann Bastoni. Um, 
she wanted to have you clarify what well attended meant for the East Norwalk meetings, what percentage of the East Norwalk residents attended? I, I don't know what the percent was, but based on all the public hearings that we've put together since I've been here, though the TOD ones were by far the, the most well attended. And I can I think that in comparison to outside of maybe one of the capital budget public hearings we have was probably better attended than any of them. I think in Appendix C of the, the plan too, they, they list the, a number of people out too. Yeah, I think those were actually undercounted too because there were a lot of people that attended the meetings that didn't sign in. So that they were basing those calculations off the sign-in sheet as opposed to the head count, which I was always doing. Um, I'm not sure you'd be able to answer this one, but um, Patricia Prince asked if it would be possible to ask Mr. Descala to, to disclose any interests he has in develop any, developing any of these parcels in question, including Wells Fargo, um, and asking if he is a Norwalk or East Norwalk resident. I don't know if he's still on, um, but I think his firm is the Wells Fargo property. I, I, he may have actually stated that, but I, I mean, I think that's public knowledge. I, I think he stated that he lives in Norwalk. Um, yeah, Tracy Barclay, um, if there were 20 meetings amongst the Oversight Committee, how is that public outreach? ENNA has had dozens and dozens of public meetings accepting input from residents and innumerable meetings amongst the committee. I think that should be clarified for the record. Outreach isn't only measured by who shows up, but by knowledge of such meetings. I can tell you for the, all the meetings we had, we you know, followed the same process that we do with the, every other meeting that the city boards and agencies have. Uh, and also I think the people that attended those meetings and, and these were, you know, three quarters of those were pre-COVID. So we were meeting in the, one of the conference rooms and talking and we actually allowed public comment on a lot of those meetings for the people who showed up and allowed them to interact with the conversations. So I think you know, we followed every procedure we, we should have. Um, this is from Lisa Prince. Um, she said she would like to voice her concerns about any development at Wells Fargo. Um, we currently have nesting swans, a flock of ducks, and many herons who live along the edges and in Mill Pond. Uh, there are raptors and other wildlife who have also returned to the pond, there has been an increasing presence of wildlife in the pond in recent years as the environment has been improved and people have become more concerned with wildlife. Putting a large development on that site is in no way environmentally beneficial or friendly. The site should be restricted to single family or multifamily homes and any plans for apartments or condos at that site should be rejected to the, due to the potential for significant negative environmental impact. And we answered that, I think, with the question about the, the existing um, asphalt parking lot, I think. Okay. Um, Louisa De Al Alco, uh, Pine Hill Extension, um, said, I would like to echo the sentiments, sentiments of the speakers who expressed disappointment in the, the fact that our concerns, wants, and requests seem to have fallen on deaf ears, our repetitive comments Regarding traffic concerns, strains on infrastructure and the school system, just to name a few, were not considered during the plan. I respectfully request that consideration be given to limit the potential density to a more reasonable number. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah I, 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 dis, I would disagree with that comment that nobody listened to their comments at all. I mean, I think the reason we have the density number and the height number proposed is because we did listen. I think it's a little, naive to think that we would do a TOD plan by its, by nearly its definition in nature that didn't propose maximizing use of property in and around a major transit station. And I, I, as I stated, I don't think we went as far as most TOD tenants would go, especially for a city of North, like Norwalk. We're not, we're not uh, a small town. It's, you know, it's a city of over 90,000 people. We proposed measures that are appropriate and measured. Also, we, we, we recognize that traffic is an issue. We, we're not blind to that. We understand that traffic until East Avenue is fully, fully amended is going to be somewhat of an issue. And obviously until exit 16 gets fixed at some 
point in the future is going to be an issue. We recognize that. We're, we're hopeful that we create an atmosphere through this plan that leads to more walkability and more bikeability. But, you know, we understand that we're a car-centric society right now. Okay. Um, from Diane CC, um, East Nor excuse me, East Norwalk has been here 100 years as district. What is the harm in waiting six months to a year to advance this plan? Can Steve give his pros and cons an opinion? And then she wanted to further stay, say that the uh, Governor Lamont's executive order extended time for land use decisions. Right, but it did not extend out the uh, adoption of this plan per se. It's a little different process. I, I don't necessarily see that there's harm with that, but I just don't understand the need to delay. I mean, as I stated at the beginning, we've been going at this for, it really at the crux of this issue for about six months. There were, and Mr. Baxendale can correct me if he feels differently, there were seven active members on this group. Um, uh, Deb Goldstein was on for a while, and then uh, the no November election of TDD was off, and then Pam Parkinson took her place. At, you know, I think Deb Goldstein, I'm not speaking for her, but I think she shared um, some of the opinions you heard tonight. I don't believe Pam Parkinson did. So at, you know, the, at that end, there were five people that were in favor of the recommendations within the plan. And then I would say at the la latter stages, there were six in favor of. So Steve, I, I, Steve, 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 please clarify, five members of what, ENNA? What are you saying? No, no, I'm sorry, the Oversight Committee, which, which was uh, an eight, I think it was an eight, maybe nine member group if you want to include me with that, um, but I'll refrain from that. But I think, you know, three quarters to at the end, over three quarters, maybe 85, 90% of the people in there were in favor of advancing the plan as proposed, including the draft zoning. And I, I know maybe Mr. Baxendale would like to comment on that. Only, the, only Steve to endorse your comment, this, the Oversight Committee has had been through this plan extensively, understanding the trade-offs and went with its majority for moving the plan forward. Thank you. All right, um, next we had Anna Tabichnek. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that again. Um, so she, she said, yes, it is generally hard for me to get out to meetings. I used to before I had a daughter, but now it is hard. Zoom and phone is great for accessibility. I do wish it was better publicized and there were ways to get more community feedback, like with a referendum or something, but I know that's not possible. I am glad to hear that they can fix city, that the city can fix sidewalks without the development plans. Side note, can they do that, please? Okay, next, any more? Um, yeah, I'll try to go to some new people. We have some repeats that we could get to near the end. Um, how, many, how many emails do you have to answer? Uh, there are eight more. Uh, a few are from Diane CC, and then um, there's Lou Garcia commented again, and I think Sarah Hunter who spoke. All right, um, please, please go to the people that we have not heard of, and then I'm looking at, I know it's 835, I know we still got more things on the agenda, but like I said before, I'm not cutting off, but um, you were going to answer the emails that you have now, okay? Okay. So every all the ones in here currently are... Um, uh, oh, Steve, the question you had received earlier, um, it was SJ. Let me see if I can pull up his, what his name was. So go to, go to the ones of the new, new people, I'll say it that way, that we have not heard from. And then you're also going to read what you have there. We're not leaving anybody off that uh, sends something in, okay? But I'm not, yeah, we're not going so to continue, continue to have um, what you have now, we're going to answer, okay? Okay. So it was uh, Justin Fargione, and he asked, um, uh, what kind of analysis has been done on the effect of increased density on local utilities? Can the existing water, sewage, electric, and inter internet utilities absorb the increased population? I know sewage is particularly ancient in places. Are there protections or is there money in place to upgrade utilities if they aren't up to the task of accommodating the new TOD zone? Yeah, so the, the plan actually addresses those in detail. Um, 
So if, if somebody proposes a project, they have to go through a process, what's called SEAC, which the Code Enforcement Action Committee, which really in a nutshell is before applications get submitted, they sit down with the various departments, and that includes um, WPCA, Public Works, uh, Fire Marshal, Building, um, Utilities, I'm, I'm probably leaving, leaving one or two off, but they go through that process before it gets to the commission level, so that way there's an understanding of what's going to be required or shortfalls in their application. So WPCA does an analysis on um, sewer capacity, and they also look at the existing infrastructure in and around that site. And if it needs to get upgraded, that's a requirement of the approval. So they have to do that um, as well. So, but the sewer capacity for what's proposed within this plan, in, as well as other de development areas, is more than adequate going forward. Obviously, at some point in time, the city's going to need to look at the, the existing um, facility, but that's not uh, required right now. Regarding the roads themselves, every application that comes forward that's you know, going to be a larger application and probably a moderate application as well is going to have to provide its own traffic study. And I know, the, you know the refrain is going to be, well, the traffic study is going to indicate that everything's fine. That may be the case, but the city put in a process a couple of years ago where we adopted a peer review process where the city hires our own um, traffic, route, uh, traffic consultant paid for by the applicant, but they're hired by the city, so they work for us, and they evaluate each application on its merits. And if they feel that there is an error in the methodology used by the applicant, they'll point that out, and you know it works very well. We have a second set of eyes on it, in addition to the city staff that already is reviewing those applications. All right, um, so Lou Garcia asked, um, uh, he disagrees with Steve's response saying to build, having to build to three and a half stories because two and a half does not work. Uh, he stated that I've worked with owners along East Ave even at two and a half stories. The problem is the parking. I'm not sure why it's difficult to understand that the taller and denser the property, the more parking you need. And there is not sufficient area to provide code compliant parking. I, I, I don't think that's difficult to understand at all. I think that the plan lays out some ideas for how that parking is going to have to work. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're going to have a second set of eyes that look at the parking standards as well as the proposed amenities. So we, we don't propose something that doesn't work. We don't want something that we think works. We want something that we believe works. Our consultants have looked at this. They're comfortable with what's proposed, but we'll have a second set of eyes look at it before it gets to the adoption phase. Um, Vicki Roos, uh, what public input has been implemented into the plan? What changed? The plan looks exactly the same as it did from day one. Well, the, the draft plan hasn't changed drastically since day one, so when it was actually a draft plan. What's changed through the process, which is really the crux of the conversation, is the, uh, the principally the zoning regulations appendix and the amenities appendix, which goes along with that, more so the zoning. So we've been adjusting that and tweaking that as it goes along. So the, I don't think there's really been any inconsistencies from, from that point of view. Um, and then, so there's really two more. Um, so one was from really Diane asking, Diane CC asking about uh, the emails, if those were gonna go into the record or if you're gonna read them out loud. All the emails were forwarded to the commission and are part of the record. Okay. And then, um, so the last written one we'll have is Jesse. We have one person raising their hand too, Fran. I don't know what you're feeling, but um, I'll read out Jesse's and then, so, so this is Jesse. She spoke earlier. Um, so she's concerned about the wildlife at Mill Pond. Um, while the concrete parking lot isn't pretty to look at, it does not harm the wildlife as a construction site will. It took many years after the pond was dredged for the wildlife to return. And she said, please consider that more seriously. And, that so, is, yeah. and I've addressed this, but just to, you know, I don't know the date of when that Wells Fargo property was redeveloped, but I imagine that there were, you know, the, it may have been done before there were serious looks at the wetlands regulation. So I imagine anything that gets done there will enhance the buffer area and add protection to the pond. I, I can't envision an application where that doesn't take place. Okay. 
And we have one person raising their hand, Fran. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So it's a telephone number ending in 467. So we just need you to say your name and address for the record. Hi, how are you? My name is Stephanie Benetti and I live on 71 Osborne Avenue. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. And, and, okay, great, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm an interior architect. Um, my business name is Sisu Interior Architecture and I currently work on multi-million dollar single residential home. Um, I have always uh, been an advocate and focused on uh, green architecture and building. Uh, and I have to kind of agree but disagree with a lot of comments um, that have gone across the board and in the last meeting and in this meeting um, as to whether, you know, the plan is a good plan or not. Um, I think that you know, living here and walking my dog every day on East Avenue um, by St. Thomas and uh, across the Rite Aid parking lot, um, I have to agree that redevelopment has to be done. And I think that it is appropriate. Um, it is an appropriate plan in increasing just one more floor in the aspect of being able to create a mixed environment, mixed use environment. So, um, you know, being able to introduce the commercial and the residential at the same time. And I think that um, a way to remedy, I, I'm a European I'm a, and I did my postgrad of city planning in Barcelona, Spain, um, and had lived there for four and a half years, uh, have found that, you know, roundabouts are very useful in redirecting traffic um, and think that the possibility of, you know, new developers on East Avenue of, of having to have set, you know, a little bit more of a setback by a couple of feet uh, would possibly allow for uh, central bike walk lanes uh, and, and the two-way directional traffic um, by, and then also eliminating some of the traffic lights, but continuing the flow of, of the traffic. Uh, I, I, I'm very cognizant of the traffic that is currently on East Avenue, having to walk by it daily and being a business owner uh, that is self-employed. Um, experience it on a daily basis and I live here and I'm very well aware of you know what the congestion could cause um, but do feel that having to introduce another floor is necessary to be able to accomplish what we all truly envision East Norwalk to be. I moved to East Norwalk three years ago. I am a native to Fairfield County uh, and I do feel, you know, I didn't move to South Norwalk for a reason. Um, and so I agree that we don't want to be South Norwalk. We don't want to be Manhattan. Uh, and we want to keep, you know, I love looking at Norwalk River, seeing the swans go by, seeing the cygnets, seeing all the natural wildlife, and think that there is a good way to be able to cross the bridge of, you know, green design and redevelopment uh, without, you know, taking away from what we have here. And so I think that, you know, the opportunity to be able to uh, implement um, a little bit more of new infrastructure as, as well as, you know, the current um, and existing residents is important. Um, but I think that through, you know, as I mentioned, roundabouts, central lanes, uh, and perhaps more community garden type of ideas rather than promenades and rather than thinking of, 
you know, I, I have the dream of, you know, be, becoming a, a design build firm and think that the addition of a one more floor wouldn't necessarily mean it's more units going in. Um, I think that the addition of one more floor could also incorporate more parking, more um, green space for that property, um, you know, communal gardens for the, the tenants at that residence. Um, and so I think that there are ways to be able to create, you know, a better living environment for all of us, which um, as a speaker had mentioned earlier, Mike uh, Descala, um, you know, it is important it, it is uh, a healthy way of living to introduce this mixed use environment. And if you do it correctly, uh, it can be done really well. And I think that um, I do have hope for um, what we can achieve. And I think that it's important um, to keep that in mind and not just shut down the idea of another floor is going to add more units because uh, I don't think that's always necessarily the case, especially if, you know, if we allow new and, and creative and creative minds to be able to take over um, what could, you know, the project I'm work currently working on um, was a project of Bruce Byfield. Um, and I think that there is hope for people who have ideas like I do. Um, and ideas like a lot of us residents that will be able to create it and and make it a reality. So that's all. And I very much thank you for allowing me to speak. Okay. <laughs> thank thank you. All right, Brian. We're done with the emails and all. Right. Let me send a new message. Can I say something, Fran? When she brought up roundabouts, I thought of you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to talk about the roundabouts, but I did bring them up in a meeting since you mentioned it as uh, something the DPW should look at uh, in terms of around the cemetery, especially because it's a it's a it's a highway and it is uh, not pedestrian or bike friendly, and a series of roundabouts and two-way traffic would uh, uh, basically calm traffic and move a higher volume at slower speeds, which is always the goal of a good traffic design. Uh, anyway, but I, I, ra I raised my hand because I want to just address, uh, it seemed like uh, quite a few people were talking about the impact on the uh, mill pond and the environment with um, uh, development at the bank. And so I'm not going to address any particular scheme. I'm just going to say that the two biggest sources of pollution in the sound, which is uh, high nitrogen, is from parking lot runoff and from lawn runoff. And the lawns on single family homes are the biggest source of chemicals, insecticides. Uh, there's theories that that affected the lobster population. Uh, certainly it, effect, it affects uh, uh, algae blooms in the sound, which create uh, low oxygen, which kill, creates uh, fish kills. Anyway, uh, right now that parking lot at Wells Fargo drains directly into Mill Pond and whatever falls on that parking lot, so oil, it's all kinds of bad things. Even bird droppings get thrown down into the mill pond, which creates algae and uh, serious issues. So uh, all the regulations now, if a new development were to go in there, uh, multifamily would be to take all the runoff on that site and put it into underground uh, uh, chambers, which filter it before it uh, goes off site. And that currently is not the case. And if there were single family homes there, there would not be uh, a condition to take runoff off the lawns and filter it. And this is a big problem in Greenwich, uh, certainly in uh, Darien, areas where large lawns are constantly being sprayed with chemicals. It washes right into the sound on these properties that are on the waterfront. So you can't control that on single family homes, but you can control it in a, more of a multifamily where you have one company uh, uh, maintaining the property and uh, one developer. So I just wanted to clear that up that right now the situation is not healthy for Mill Pond <laughs> with that runoff and uh, potential development could improve that. Uh, and I'm just speaking in general terms here. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, okay, Brian, so. Yeah, one, one more um, and then if you wanna 
What? Who's it? Who's it from? Who is it? Uh, Mimi Chang at Raymond Terrace. That's going to be the last one, right? You got no more? Okay, go ahead. Um, so she asked, uh, do piecemeal traffic studies conducted on individual parcels slated for apartment develop development actually capture the collective impact the cars generated by them have on the currently terrible traffic situation? If we are not studying the traffic analysis in a more holistic way, are we setting ourselves up to exacerbate an already bad, really bad traffic situation? Sure, I can, I can address that. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, in a perfect world, we would have had an extra $200,000 to do a, you know, traffic study from the beach up through 95, but that wasn't part of the plan, so we used uh, what we had. And the good thing is there's data available from the 230 East Ave project, and there's information available as part of the WalkBridge program because they're looking at the, the, you know, the East Avenue stre stretch from 95 down to the train station. And every application that comes through is going to have to you know, follow industry standards and look at what this development is going to do, what intersections are going to be affected, where traffic is going to go, the existing, existing levels of service, et cetera. And then we're going to look at that with our own set of eyes to make sure that what they're putting forth is correct and that we agree with it. And if it's not, then if, and if they can't mitigate the condition, if, you know, the application turns out it makes it worse, then the, then the commission would probably have to deny that application. Okay. So I think we're at the end of the public hearing. As I stated earlier, I'm leaving because there was some miscommunication. I'm leaving it open for emails to come in, commentary until close of business tomorrow. Okay, so close. We're at the end of the public hearing for this evening. We're gonna take a, a five minute break before we start on our uh, regular agenda, okay? Everybody? Okay. Can you pause it? Is that possible? Yes, I will stop the recording. And again, and then I might as well stream it back on YouTube. While you're streaming, it'd be very good if we had the number of people who actually clicked on the YouTubes. So oh, yeah, all. I can get that for you. Yeah. And that's what Steve needs because when he does so, it does how many people have attended, participated, and all that good stuff in those excellent charts we had at the beginning of the night. Yeah, so I think maxing out in the people on the Zoom call was around 49.50. And so right. far, the YouTube has had 25 views. Okay. I think we had 84 on the um, on the first meeting at one no, point. It was, it was over 100, I think. I'll check. But. No, I, no, at one point, it was just a, a touch in time. You told me we had uh, 84, but that, that wasn't the latest uh, data. Oh, I got yeah. So if we could keep that cumulative, especially from when we first started this, I know there were not all unique people, but it's still a significant number as it starts mounting. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't know if they can track, um, that's an interesting question, if they can track individual watches and unique watches. Mary's shaking her head, but it depends what systems you have. We should be able to do that if we want to. But I don't think you can track people doing YouTube because there's no way to go back to who's actually gone to the YouTube because it's de-identified. Yeah, you're right, it's so, de-identified. We can see that you had 354 views. Right, but, that, but, but if you've had multiple people, you don't necessarily know that those are 350 unique people. Yeah, not unique. No, not unique. I understand that. Yeah, so the last meeting, which was on the 18th, so far is 159 views. Great. We're live now. Yeah, we're, we're back up and running. Okay, so um, public hearing will accept comments until uh, close of business tomorrow. Uh, I'm looking to, unless uh, anybody uh, from the commission wants to discuss, ask Steve any questions right now or, you, or specific questions uh, regarding the TOD. Uh, 
I would say if you're asking Steve a question and, and then Steve is going to answer, it'd be a good idea to Steve, if it comes to you and then you CC all of us or so that we all have the same information. And, okay. um, and I'm going to, we'll, we'll probably, well, we'll, pro we'll, we'll discuss this as, which we don't have a date yet, at the meeting where we're going to talk about the um, North 7. So we're going to add this item to that agenda and, uh, and talk about it. But I'm not stopping anybody from anybody wants to discuss things right now as far as discussion point or question or whatever, uh, feel free right now. Anybody in the commission? Could I ask a question, please? This is Tammy. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, I lost connectivity there for a while. Steve, can you please clarify what we can't we can't hear you we the got number to, of total apartment uh tammy we cannot tammy we can't hear you yes oh. tammy, can you, hear me, can you hear me i think i got your question i'm trying to... what's the question I, I'm trying on my cell phone. You sound yeah, good I, now. Can you clarify the number of total apartments this was built out? Yeah, let, let's um, hold on one sec. I didn't hear. What's the question? She's asking for the total number of potential units um, that could be built out. So there, in the, the zone we're talking about, which is the proposed village district, if you simply do a, a, a very rudimentary mathematical calculation and take that total area and divide it by the maximum density that they could potentially realize, which is one unit for every 825 square feet, you could get approximately 700 units. Um, the consultant doesn't think that's a realistic number and they're more in the you know 300 range the other component to this was the proposed amendment which is to the industrial one zone which would allow um, residential above the ground floor commercial that in it itself is the difference between where people are getting the 1300 unit uh, scenario from so that adds about another 600 units, a little less than that, but that's roughly it. So just keep in mind too that, you know, as we discussed, we're, we're about to take the, you know, kick off the industrial zone study. So if you were concerned about density and thought of a, you know, a potential compromise, we could remove that component um, as a recommendation within the zoning and just put it off to get looked at later on if that was something that, you know, people thought was a good compromise. Thank you. So, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. May I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, so there were uh, several comments and we got, I think, a lot of emails referring to thousands of apartments, uh, in a couple of cases, thousands of apartments. And also we know the images that were circulated by the ENNA in a few of their notices showed high-rise apartment buildings, some of them Soviet style, you know, eight, 10 stories, some I think 12 story. And I think that's where we, a lot of people thought that we're turning East Norwalk into Stamford or South Norwalk. And I wanna just clarify that that was misinformation that was deliberately spread. And I called it out and I've been attacked for it, but I just want to uh, say that when you spread misinformation, you invalidate the criticisms that come because people actually, a lot of people did mention tonight, they don't want East Norwalk to turn into Stanford and there's no high rises. It's an extra story on a building. I mean, let, let's be realistic about this. And so uh, I just wanna say that uh, there was misinformation. We, have, we, we know it, we, we have copies of all these uh, photos that went out to basically frighten people 
that this was coming and all of these thousands of apartments were coming. So now we find out 700 units, might be possible another 600 units on industrial, which would help financially monetize those properties for the current owners. And I wanna just mention, the, uh, uh, one of the commenters earlier mentioned uh, a, a design build business, if they could actually have a business and live on top of it, which was the intent from from the plan. Is that all correct, Steve? Correct. Yeah, that was uh, that was early on in the process when that was spread. I mean, and you know, to to the the, the positive point is it got people interested in the 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 um, study we were working on. But on the negative side, I mean, there was an there was an article in the Norwalk Hour. Someone put an op-ed in last week saying, you know, there was going to be 180 something units on the Mill Pond property, and I was like, well, unless they annexed about four other properties that's not mathematically feasible so i think you know once sometimes once people get that in their mind they they kind of take that to heart and they disregard you know just the, the premise of the whole plan i mean i to me a three and a half story building that's you know you go to some of the surrounding you know single family residential neighborhoods in darien and westport and those those houses are just as tall as what we're proposing on east avenue which is walking distance to a Metro North mainline train station. So it's a little, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to reconcile it. Well, I, I don't know the motivation to intentionally mislead people except to get appeal to emotion and to get people riled up. And so uh, I think that we need to deal with facts here and we need to deal with reality and not deal with uh, misinformation that we could hear it from people. I mean, somebody even said there might be 800 units on Mill Pond. Somebody said that tonight, that with, we're proposing possible 800 units of housing on Mill Pond when it's, I think, 87, uh, I, I, apparently. I, I think that's a maximum number mentioned. So anyway, uh, I, I just want to say there's a lot of misinformation floating around there. and. Uh, we are trying to listen to everybody and take, take it in and filter out the, the comments that are coming from uh, propaganda. May I, ask a, may I make a comment, Fran? Go yep, go ahead. Um, Steve, Steve Kleppen, I don't know how much extra work it would be, but I definitely saw coming through loud and clear that people felt like they weren't being uh, heard. And I'm wondering if on the website, there could be a list of frequently asked questions that might be able to give accurate information about some of this density, as well as um, you definitely got some repeat themes. And I think that you had answers uh, that you'd given thought to um, that at least people would feel like um, they're being heard and you can put an answer to it. Um, and also, I think um, being really clear about what the process was, and I agree with Brian's earlier comment about giving a sense about how much input there has been. Um, but I'm just thinking that it would be a good idea to acknowledge people's questions. And I think that there are thoughtful answers to it. And you're not going to necessarily um, convince everybody, but it just seems like the most appropriate way to respond to make sure that people feel like their questions are getting answered. Yeah, I can, I can put something together and circulate it around too, if you want a list of ideas. I, at one point I almost was thinking of doing an op-ed and putting it in the papers, but I was like, you know, then I don't know. I, I pluses and minuses with that too. But I, wherever you want to do, I'm fine. Brian, may I say something? Yeah, go ahead. I think I support Mary and I'd also suggest, as I've done an email to you today, Steve, the more we can quantify, get the real numbers on the table, as you did on that first set of slides, which I thought were very good, including the number of people who participate or the number of persons we have present, even though they're not unique people, we can't do that. It's just interesting. And your basic, the basic logic of the Todd, which is, as you said, and I think it's worth saying again, yes, increased density near stations for many reasons, so it also produces the livable but vibrant center which we need, especially if you concentrate it totally on East Avenue, 
we now need to rework the symmetry area as best we can, as Mike made these roundabouts. That area from there, what's south, except the Wells Fargo site, is a, is, a, is a lovely area to live in. And that's why mo where most of these people come from. And if you hear many of them, there are some have been very recent, but many of them are 40 and 50 years. <laughs> so I applaud them. And uh, the only downside to this is possible congestion. Uh, few more people. What's the real size and number of those new people? What could it be on the actual density we're talking about? And then really, what is it like if you had 50% of that, which is the probably most you're ever going to get developed over 10 years or whatever number you care to add. But let's get some numbers out there so we can quell a lot of this. And Mary's point very much that you've answered lots of these things, but let's have them in writing in almost one document. And I think an op-ed would be very good as well. If you want to draft it, I'll basically put it in for you if you feel it's inappropriate for the director to put it in. I'll no, I think that's the cat's out of the, the bag at this point, so I might as well just do it myself. <laughs> I thought that might compromise you. Great, go for it, Steve. <laughs> no, I have done that in the past and in, in other things I've done. Um, I just, you know, the, 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 it's the funny thing in the last five years, the platform has changed so much, so I, did, I never, like, not to, you know, which is good because Nancy on Norwalk gets a lot of good comments. And it, sure. it informs me about what people are thinking, but I don't want to ever get to the stage where I'm spending half my day just going back and forth trading barbs with somebody about something where I no. think they're wrong. So I'm trying to not get to that. I don't think Mary or I were either suggesting is trading barbs. There were certain things that are coming through. We need to be, you gave good answers. I mean, it's not, it's probably one page worth of good stuff with some with some real numbers, which lays the, lays the data on the table for people, like your first four slides, a little bit more numbers around those slides. Okay. And, St and Steve, once you get that done, I would be happy to write something for the paper, just sort of saying um, what the process has been like and how we're trying to be responsive. Uh, so once you get those questions up, I think it would be fine to, or Fran could do it, but I mean, just to tell people that We've heard no, loud and clear. The people want to be here. Want to be heard. I think Steve can cover all of the above without anybody else. Um, um, let's have one, one thought process. So Steve, if you're going to put something in, then address process and numbers and whatever instead of having fragmented um, inputs. I prefer one. So you're the man, Steve. Okay, I'm on it. And, okay. and to be clear, the city, in this case, is the applicant. So th this is not uh, like a uh, developer coming forward with an application where it would be inappropriate for either a uh, commissioner or the staff to comment. This is a, this is a different situation. This is a, uh, ap this is a planning application, I guess. Is that correct, uh, Steve, if that was a proper way to phrase right. it? So th yep. this is really from, from and the city charter uh, is very clear that the planning commission is tasked, which is something we, I, I take to heart, but a lot, of, a lot of us may forget at times, and I, sometimes I forget it, but the, the, the city, the, it's actually the state, um, uh, whatever they call it, the code, the law, state law, states that uh, statute, state statute is for planning commissions to educate the public on items that are in the uh, POCD. So the, the, uh, this would fall into that category. So part of it is education. And so our discussions, your editorial, et cetera, would be something that we're using to educate the public about what's in the POCD. Anyway, that's my two cents. Nope. Fran stepped out. That's a very surreal shot. Sorry, I had to I had to step out a second. Did you have a question for me? Nice paneling. <laughs> no, I, don't even, I don't think anybody has a question for you, Fran. I think it's just the next item. I don't know. Okay, then well what I have here is uh we talked about that this item is going to be on our agenda whenever that um, Steve looks at the, everybody's dates and we schedule the next meeting, which will address the North 7 and this issue. 
So now we go on to the transportation and the A24 referral. Transportation, mobility, and parking. It's the Norwalk River Valley Trail construction connection from Union Park to New Canaan Avenue. Is anybody on or are you, uh, you guys are, are it? We have Mike from uh, TMP here to go over it. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Hi, commission commissioners. Uh, thank you for hearing me tonight. Uh, before you is the, uh, the, uh, what they, what they, what we kind, kindly refer to as the missing link. It's a piece of Norwalk River Valley Trail that'll connect the existing section at Union Park that ends at Union Park to the section up at, on uh, New Canaan Avenue alongside the uh, the uh, 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 f Northeast facilities there on the river. Uh, this this is being funded by the. Uh, under a under a grant from Federal Highways, it's an 80-20 eighty twenty grant. Uh, the feds will pay eighty percent of the cost. The city is paying the other twenty percent of the cost. And uh, I don't know if you have any other questions on the trail. I'd be happy to uh, speak to them. I'm looking at them. I'm looking for the things that I printed. Um, which I might not have printed that when I printed the city sidewalk one. Was there a, uh, I think, and maybe I don't remember correctly, is there a gap in funding? You need more funding? There is, yeah. I remember 600,000 from the capital budget, then you had the grant. Is there, a, are you asking for any more money of the city? No, we're, we're not asking for any, any money at this point. Uh, we'll be advertising for bids uh hopefully uh in about a month from now uh uh right now we have we have enough to cover the anticipated expenses i'm going to write that down so when you come back in january i'm going to pull out my notes okay <laughs> sounds like a very good deal to me chair completes the link gets it done with federal funding with the gap already approved by us at the capital level excellent yeah. Any comments from uh, anybody? Questions? So Steve, we can take a vote right now? Yeah, he went to the bathroom, but you can. Okay, uh, so I know I read the, I know you sent the uh, resolution, but I, I guess I didn't print it out here. That's right, so, I pulled it up on the screen for you. All right, so I move that we, uh, Accept the resolution as stated for approval. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, all in, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any uh, nays? Any abstentions? I didn't hear Tammy, is she on? I, yeah, I'm here, but I can't, I seem to get connected. We were just voting on the Norwalk River Valley Trail item. Yes, I'm, I'm listening, but I don't think you guys can hear me. We can hear you right now. So oh, you can. Can. You okay, great. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I, I, uh, here we know. Record of your vote. We have a unanimous vote. Okay. Uh, Ryan, yes. can I just take your second question? I, Mike Yosak, if you're still there, do you have any update on? Yeah, but listen, um, hold on, hold on. We just voted. Okay. I asked for comments before, so I'm, I this, was trying. I couldn't get it unmuted or whatever the problem was. Did Never you vote? Never mind. All right, I'll I'll ask in private. Yes, I voted in favor. Okay, so no, it's not a thing of asking him in private. Um, we voted. We recorded the vote. Is Mike still on? I'm still here. All right. Uh, you want to ask your question, Tammy? Yes, please. Yeah. Right, go ahead. Mike, is the, has the connection been made or plans to be made up by the Merit 7 and the uh, end of the connector? Uh, yeah, uh, they, they are working on it with, with, with Wilton. Uh, I know the plans are pretty much ready, and I 
think they're they're looking to try to get something under construction uh, this year. I'm not 100% uh sure where it where it stands as of today but i can certainly check on it for you okay yeah i mean up by where the you know the development at the top of glover avenue by the dmv is it going to go i think we talked about it a little bit with the uh merit seven project yeah, yeah there, there's there's the will walk portion which would go from uh kind of like it where the grist mill uh intersection mm -hmm. is it would run up mm -hmm. through through Wilton up to uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the, the first street up in up in Wilton Kent, there. Like Kent Street or something. Kent, I'm Kent, Kent yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm most concerned about by the end of the connector where people drop down onto Main Avenue right by the DMV because that to me is the most dangerous place yeah. for anybody to be crossing. Yeah. We, we've been kind of working with the DOT on that. That's still, that'll probably still be a little bit of a while off, but uh, it looks like they're going to be, they're trying to find some funds for it. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so next on the agenda is the, uh, another A24 referral. Uh, this is the construction of ADA compliant city hall campus sidewalks. Anybody have any questions on that one? Okay, hearing none, I move that we accept the, uh, I've lost the word now, the, um, that we move this forward as an approval and accept the resolution uh, as is. Do I have a second? Seconded. Second. Okay, and uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Is, uh, is Steve Ferguson still on? Yeah. No, he was having connect. Uh, he lost power, I think, so. No. Just, uh, just for the record, so that we have, when I said, I don't know if he voted before, we said unanimous, and for this vote here, if Steve's not on, so it's six people. John Lesko still on? No, John lost power too. Cool. Wow. So we got to be careful on what's the vote? Is the vote uh, six? What is it? What do we have? It'd be the five. five. And I don't know if Tamara's still on or if she's kind of in limbo too because of the power. Her or name's the on the list. Sorry. Go ahead. Mary. I was just going to say her name's on the list, Tamara's name. No, Tamara just spoke. So, and she voted before. Okay. So the only thing is, I think we're missing uh, John Lesko and uh, Steve Ferguson, right? So we have uh, six votes. Brian, Steve, that's what I'm, I'm asking you. Yeah, yep. You got, got that down? Okay. So next is- I, I wanted to just say something real quick. Go ahead. The second taxing district did not lose its power. My husband is chairman. I just want to leave it at that. <laughs> so what's going on with the electricity then? Anyway. Uh, I don't know, but we have power in South Norwalk. <laughs> okay. We have power in East Norwalk as well. <laughs> All right, so we took the two. Are we, are we good with the two votes, Brian? Yes, yep. All right, so next on the agenda is the capital budget schedule. Steve, I yeah. thought we had put this we have, we have put this to bed or not or not yet. Am I yeah. I'm not sure if we quite ratified it, but it, unless I hear something different, your meeting starting in 2021 calendar year will be the second Wednesday of every month. So you're going to send that out as the official, not right now, but you'll send out the uh, second Wednesday. You'll send us the schedule, right? Correct. Yeah, you'll you'll approve your meeting schedule probably at your November meeting. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, I don't know if Tammy uh, Langalis can speak. Any or Steve? Anything new on the industrial zone study update? I don't know if Tammy has responded to my doodle poll on a meeting because we're trying to get a meeting together in the next two weeks. I'm waiting for a couple. Oh. Uh, 
consultant is moving. Yeah, my bad. I don't think I have responded to your doodle poll. Sorry, there were too many <laughs> options. <laughs> I probably, she probably ignored your doodle poll like the, like I did because I, I don't know what this is and moved on. Yeah, uh, yeah pick a date. She ignored the remember. other doodle poll too, I noticed. You hear, you hear what she said? You hear what she said? Pick a date and she'll deal with it. <laughs> right. Okay. Anything else? Are we, there's no uh, update on that one? Just trying to meet, uh, meet with the consultant or what? Yeah, so I, I have a call with them. I can't remember if it's tomorrow or Wednesday. And then we're going to format the setup for the first meeting, which at the first meeting will really just kind of lay out the groundwork of how they're going to go forward in terms of schedule, public outreach, and meetings, those kind of things. Okay, I think uh, I messed up with the A. A is the capital budget schedule, not our planning commission meeting schedule. What did you want to say about the capital budget schedule? I, I think, well, yeah, what I started to say, I think that was just kind of a incorrect wording on the agenda. That was meant to be your meeting schedule, not the it was originated from the capital budget concern, but that's why it got labeled that way. Yeah, because Angela wanted to change meetings because of conflicts and whatever, whatever. This aligns much better with the BET finance and everything else, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Approval of minutes. Is everybody ready to look at the minutes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I move that we accept the June 16 uh, meeting minutes as they are. Do I have a second? Who's second? Tammy. Tammy, okay. We got two Tammys. We're going to have to. Uh, <laughs> no, nope, uh, Mara and Tammy. No, it's okay. As long as we, we, we'll get, we'll, we'll get, um, we'll get there. Steve, you have somebody, somebody taking minutes, right? Diane taking minutes? Yeah, Diane is right there. Okay, Diane. All right, so we approved the June 16th meeting uh, minutes. We're moving on to the July 21st. Any comments on that one? Okay, I move that we accept the July 21st, 2020 minutes as they are. Second. I have a Tammy second. Langales. Okay, seconded by Tammy Langalis. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And now we're moving on to the August 18 minutes. Anybody have any comments on that one? Okay, I move that we accept August 18, 2020 minutes as they are. Second. Who's second it? Tammy Langalis. Okay. All right, we're done with the minutes. Comments of the director. Um, so just to give you kind of backtracking a little bit on the trying to get the meeting date for the North 7 application, the leading contenders right now are Tuesday, September 1st and Wednesday, September 2nd. Um, Tammy and Fran, do those two dates work for you? Yeah, I can't check because I'm using my phone right now. So I'll write it down and then. Uh... One sec, I'll let you know. I haven't heard what from Steve what, what, or John yet. So I'll, I emailed them separately and I'll try to confirm with them tomorrow for sure. We're going to start. Tuesday the 1st, or what was the other one? Wednesday the 2nd. I can, and those are evening, right? Correct. Yes, I can do either one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is, is everybody good with either one or we have, I, I, I don't know, Steve, if you want to send yeah. something out tomorrow saying which is yeah. better, you know, I don't know. Every, everybody agreed to those two dates. The other date I proposed had some conflicts, so. So right now you have, if you could do those, Fran, you have six out of your eight. We would just need to, you know, you have a quorum so you could go forward either way. All right, which one did everybody pick? Both of those were equal. We'll see. I know, but I'm saying, what, what are we, what's the preference here? The first or the second? Doesn't matter to me. 
Steve, what's better for you? Second. Oh. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> right, if all things being equal, we'll look for the second. Uh, second is fine. All right. I'll, I'll check with Steve and John tomorrow, see what they say. If we can com accommodate Diana, we'll accommodate Diana. Thank you. And, and Diana is the most important person up here, right? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so September 2nd at 6.30, we'll get, we'll get notified, but unless we hear differently from, from you, Steve, we'll put it on our calendar. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? Not for myself, no. Comments of commissioners? Anybody? Uh. I'd love to know when uh, more offices at City Hall are going to open up, if anybody has any insight. A little bit. They are actually working on um, an appointment system, so you can make appointments to come in. I don't know the extent of every department, what they're putting forward, but they're working on that now, and they're hoping to roll that out very soon. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I have one. I was asked uh, by the redevelopment, they're putting a, uh, a working group or whatever they're called, Steve, I don't know, task force or oversight committee, I don't know, uh, to do with the uh, south, the area around the South Norwalk train station. So uh, Barry Paniston is going to be the pl uh, planning commission representative on uh, that group. And he'll be... Um, you know, Brian was on the East Norwalk and uh, people before were on different ones. And so Mary will be representing us and giving us updates uh, at our meetings when um, as applied. Okay, so thank you, Mary, for uh, agreeing to, uh, to serve on that committee. Okay, uh, I don't have any other comments. Any uh, last round, does anybody have anything else to say? All right, since uh, Tammy Langallis is having problems uh, with her usual thing to do, Mike Mushak, I'm asking you to make the motion. Oh, I make the motion, <clears throat> excuse me, I make the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Lou. I'll second right. it. Oh. Okay, <laughs> thank you everyone, be well. And uh, thank, thank you, you. Too.